So to put this into context, I'd like to show a quick, short video. If you'll roll the video, please. Give me a range and grid to the target. Range is 1,700 meters. Hey, we're still waiting for the satellites to acquire. Can I get a status check on all the vehicles over the target region? Sir, all birds in the area are healthy. We have a good file on the GPS. Building grid, 42 Tango, Charlie Whiskey, 982-468. Roger, give me a sensor over the target. Bronco, this is double three. We have eyes on the target area. Currently eyes on three tangos. Requesting ISR to verify HVT. Alpha one, Bronco five three. Currently double one requesting to armed overwatch. Request you push the double one at the following grid. 42, Tango, Charlie, Whiskey, 98. Roger, Bronco, pushing to double one and we'll contact him on yellow zero one. Stand by for full 360. Looking for a positive ID on HVT1, how copy? Good copy, standing by. How's the feed look? Hey, what's the status of Alpha 1? I show no interference, RPA Alpha 1. Good handshake with Alpha 1. Double 3, your Reaper is on station. Call sign Alpha 1, how copy? Good copy, call sign Alpha Zero 1. Requesting follow on cast to our location as well. Double 3, you have two F-16s inbound. TOT is 15 mics, call sign Hornet 1. Double three, Bronco 533, be advised we're showing indications of jamming over the target area. Bronco, Devil 03, how do you read? Bronco, Devil 03, how do you read? Enemy station, station, Devil 03, how do you read? So the Airmen of Air Force Space Command, about 36,000, come to work every day to make sure that that what if doesn't happen. And I'm, again, privileged, very privileged to serve with an incredible group of leaders that are here with me on the stage. What I'd like you to do, what I'd like to do is turn the microphone over. They'll introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their wings. We'll go down the line, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, sir. Uh, I'm Brigadier General Wayne Monteith, commander of the 45th Space Wing and director of the Eastern Range. That's Patrick Air Force Base and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. At the two launch wings, control of the battlefield begins with us. We provide assured access to space, and at the 45th Space Wing, we are the world's premier gateway to space. This fiscal year, we have launched 21 space missions. That represents over one quarter of all space missions in the world, and we've done it while fighting through two hurricanes. This calendar year, we continue to break barriers. The X-37 launched a week and a half ago, right before Hurricane Irma hit. It was launch number 15 for us this year. That means we have launched more than Russia, and we have launched more than China. In addition to that, we have also landed seven Falcon 9 first stage boosters. We have demonstrated that we can launch every vertical launch system in the U.S. inventory, and now flying autonomous flight safety systems, we've taken our uh, capability to launch quickly from 72 hours last year to now I can shoot twice in 24 hours. We provide everything the warfighter needs in space. Thank you very much. My name is Jennifer Grant. I'm the commander for the 50th Space Wing at Schriever Air Force Base, and it's a pleasure to be here today. At Schriever, we have 6,880 people assigned here to the wing, and we've been focused primarily on providing global combat effects. The video you just witnessed is 
what we do in part at Schriever. But just like we've been talking about breaking down barriers, uh, that's what we're doing at Schriever as well and at the 50th. We're now focused on evolving space and cyberspace warfighting superiority through integrated and innovative operations. And that affects our global positioning system, our communication in space, space situational awareness. And we also have at Schriever in the 50th, the third, uh, third uh, space experimental squadron doing some of our or on orbit testing for new systems and our communication squadron, which is at the forefront of the Air Force's cyberspace, uh, cyber squadron initiative. Our space mission force has been the leader in space and with the shift and change in landscape for space and cyberspace operations, from the assumption that we could operate in a benign environment to an acknowledgement that space and cyberspace are contested, congested, and can be degraded, we've been at the forefront of the space mission force development as it relates to and supports the space superiority initiatives. This construct in ensures a more consistent presentation of forces, as you've heard, to the combatant commanders, although we've referred to this uh, in large part at our wing as being deployed in place. We have a four-month deployment phase on console and four-month dwell time, during which period we are focused on developing our tactics and procedures and doing some advanced academic training. We began this construct on the 1st of February in 2016, and we're 18 months in and ready to begin the next rotation on the 1st of October. We really are beginning to break down that barrier of reconstituting our forces and being prepared for a degraded, contested environment in space. Thank you. I'll choose this mic. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Colonel David Miller, the commander of the 460th Space Wing Panthers. Um, our mission set is to provide ballistic missile warning and infrared surveillance for this nation and our allies. So on behalf of the men and women of the 460th Space Wing, I'd like to say you're welcome. Um, I think the best way to, to introduce the wing's mission sets is perhaps to introduce one of the airmen I brought with me today. Senior Airman Jacqueline Kidd is standing up, or she's gonna be standing up shortly. There she is, right there. She's uh, one of our senior airmen who's actually the youngest mission crew chief we're gonna have on our crew force and one of the most talented operators and warfighters that we have. Thank you for coming. You guys owe her a big round of applause. <laughs> because on that operations floor, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there is no backup team that's going to do the missile warning mission for America. It's her and the warfighters that she does the job with on a day-in and day-out basis that are going to get it done. And when you consider the global responsibilities that they have, when you consider that when we started this business, there were two principal adversary or threat countries that we were concerned about with about four different missile types, and that today we're approaching 20 different nations with ballistic missile capability and dozens of different missile types, and those can change on a day-to-day -day basis you get a sense of just how important the responsibility is. And these are men and women who are in their early 20s. They're so much more capable than I was when I was an operator. And they deserve the gratitude of the nation because they just don't get a break. There's no stand down because of uh, an oxygen problem. There's no stand down because of any other work that needs to be done. That mission must get done 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I think that's one of the differences that you see sometimes that doesn't get talked about enough is that while we have backup systems in redundancy, it's gonna be the same team of experts that are gonna take care of this mission for America and our allies. I think the most visible manifestation of what has changed is what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in that operations floor and what Senior Airman Kidd does now that we didn't do when I was a crew member there, I'm not gonna say how many years ago. Um, it was more than a week ago. Uh, in the, in the get-in shift now, and what you will see is a thorough discussion of the threats on orbit, terrestrial based and cyber that would face uh, and contend with the capability set that we provide. What you begin to see is robust mission planning and execution based off the range of possible courses of action an adversary might choose. What you see is rehearsal of ways we're gonna respond so that plans and TTPs become habits and that it is not something that you're thinking of as the moment occurs. And what you are beginning to see more and more of is more between the wings.
team commanders in particular to my right and my left. Um, and I think that that is going to be successful in the future. and Jacqueline Kidd that they will be there to provide this capability that simply is unmatched for any other potential adversary or otherwise. We need to do it on a 24-7 basis because the American people and our allies expect it. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Todd Moore, Commander of the 21st Space Wing and Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. Commander of an Air Force wing whose primary mission sets include ground-based missile warning, missile defense, and awareness. Our mission is to execute combined global capabilities to defend the homeland and to enable space combat operations. We assert this space authority through discipline, bold. I am proud of those airmen, relentless in accomplishing the mission, and they is essential to our way of life and our way of war, and it's worth defending. Our capability to watch adversarial missile launches has been in several decades. With an increasing amount of nations developing ICBM capability, missile warning is an increasingly important rapid detect and dissemination information for, our, uh, important for dissemination to our nation's leaders. Our missile defense mission is a growing effort that pairs Army and Navy missile tracking and shoot-down capability with our, missile, with our missile warning network. The 21st Space Wing is a part of a global space surveillance network designed to detect, track, and report man-made objects orbiting Earth for potential threats or hostile action. Nine of our operational units conduct space surveillance, maintaining awareness of all near-Earth and deep space cataloged objects. They collect, collect roughly 400,000 observations per day and track 23,000 objects. The 18th Space Control Squadron averages 10 collision warning notifications per day. And based on this data, just last year, satellite owners and operators reported maneuvering their satellites to avoid uh, collisions approximately 100 times. As we transition into a new era of space operations, we need to move away from simply tracking objects in space for catalog maintenance as if we're observing a benign environment. We need to change the way we're thinking about space and acquire, train, and employ capabilities that treat space as a contested domain. We need to purposefully observe and orient to understand what adversaries may be doing so that we can enable operations that achieve joint warfighting objectives. And one of those top priorities is to deter a conflict in space. The United States remains committed to the free use and access of space for peaceful purposes by all nations. But the reality is we can't always assume that all nations will pursue only peaceful purposes. If we fail to make these changes in the way we acquire, train, and employ space capabilities, or even more importantly, the way we think about space, we may be judged harshly by history. I look forward to your questions either now here on the panel or at any point during the rest of the conference. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, Colonel Mykoff, commander of the 30th Space Wing out at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, the uh, one of two launch wings in uh, Air Force Base Command, but also one of two launch wings in the Air Force. Uh, our mission set, uh, where we, we provide indispensable launch, landing, and range capability. Um, for our nation. A launch in the form of, of placing satellites into a polar orbit. We are uh, strategically where we sit out in California. We're, we're strategically placed to do that. We also um, support Global Strike in the operational test and evaluation of the Miniman 3 system and, and Missile Defense Agency in also the OT&E of the uh, ground-based interceptor. For landing, landing capability, uh, we are the uh, backup location or emergency landing location for uh, X-37 operational test vehicle, uh, as well as, and, and the 45th is way ahead of us here, so I have to give them the kudos, but we're also going to be, uh, uh, SpaceX is going to be landing for the first time, hopefully here in January, on uh, terra firma out there at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. They've already done the drone ship thing, so we're looking forward to supporting them in that. And then for the range capability, we provide the uh, telemetry, the optics, the communication 
uh, for all those uh, players to, to uh, launch. And that's not insignificant. Vandenberg is the third largest uh, Air Force base um, in, our, in our Air Force and um, with over 100,000 acres. And so we have a, a very, very large range that, uh, that I've got wonderful airmen that uh, support and take care of and, again, provide that capability to the nation. Thank you. All right, there's no shortage of questions. Um, it's great to be the moderator. So for the wing commanders, uh, you'll notice there's no questions here for General Raymond. Um, for the wing commanders, what should a young cadet know about the space sector before they potentially join Space Command upon commissioning? I'll start to say that's pretty easy. It's exciting to be in the space enterprise right now. It is the future. Uh, whether it's war fighting in space, preparing to war fight in space, uh, we've moved from a relatively benign environment to a rapidly uh, more and more contested in environment. And if we are not prepared to fight in that domain, that fight will come to us. And so the opportunities are endless, whether it's uh, flying a satellite, doing missile warning, or uh, if you're like me and you're a little boy at heart, uh, and you can't drive a truck for a living, launching rockets is about the next best thing. Launching rockets is fun, sir. Yeah. I, I, would also, I would also recommend to a cadet who is interested in exploring and, and eventually becoming part of our space enterprise here to take advantage of all of the educational opportunities that you have at your fingertips while you are in that type of an environment. Uh, to learn both in the classroom academics, but also too, to exercise your critical thinking skills because we are always looking for folks who are able to think outside the box. Earlier today you heard General Goldfein talk about, hey, we're in an era right now where we need people who are going to be versed to solve problems who don't just think outside the box, but we're thinking about throwing away the box. And so for our young folks who are in school, and who have an opportunity in a very safe and you know, creative exploratory type of environment to really don't be, don't be limited by the types of problem sets or the questions that you can ask and, and to be able to do that in particular where you have some, some practical application in that regard too. That's all good. I think the only thing to add uh, from my perspective is why don't you just come see us? Um, <laughs> We have a number of programs, particularly, uh, I can speak for myself, uh, I partner with both the ROTC detachment at Colorado State University, as well as the ROTC detachment at CU Boulder. And we host those cadets in particular, but certainly the Air Force Academy cadets when they come up as well during their summer break. Um, and I think that is the best exposure that you can get to operations. Um, and there are a range, you also get an appreciation for the range of skill sets and jobs that must be performed in order to ensure that we're successful. So whether you as a cadet choose to do space operations or not, you choose to be, you know, if you come to Buckley to get a look at the cyber mission defense team, you choose to get a look at one of the defenders, I brought one of them with me here today. Um, there's a bunch of people who gotta do their part in order to make these missions work. And when you are dealing with uh, critical infrastructure to the extent that we have um, at each one of these bases, uh, we really do fight from our bases. And it really is a team effort. Um, so I would encourage you to come out and visit. Uh, I'll, I'm sure all of us will stick around afterward and um, take the opportunity. We'll set something up and we, can, we do this on a regular basis. Um, because just like our forefathers in the Air Corps set about educating the American people on the importance of air power, it's our responsibility to do the same for space power. Uh, first thing I would say is, is uh, climbing into a, some kind of advanced orbital mechanics would be a, a first, a great step. We need to move from, we are evolving to go from two dimensions plus time. Uh, air power is three dimensions plus time. Space operations really is five, dim five dimensions plus time. When you consider about how, how we operate in space, that would be my first. Um, the second would be, uh, if you're looking at industry, look at distributed architectures um, and how those operations are in place and what are the opportunities to, to model those. And then the last thing would be to take uh, a look at how industry does systems uh, integration 
uh, and working off uh, the delivery of certain products uh, because ultimately we, we are trying to, I think, trying to follow a similar model so we can get operations online quickly. Yeah, and just to kind of put a cap on this and really to echo what General Monteith was saying, this really is an exciting time uh, to be in the space business, in particular launch. Um, you know, you, you've seen what SpaceX is doing and other commercial providers that are coming on, on board are, are looking at doing the same, you know, same type of things again. But what that forces us to do is to be innovative on our part. We don't want to be the ones from the space on, on the Air Force side of the house to, to, to say no or that we can't do that. We try to keep up with them. So, and again, it's forcing us to relook how we do business. And finally, that you've heard, what you've seen here up on the stage, is that uh, space is a very diverse mission set. So we have launch, um, satellite command and control. You've got uh, ground-based missile warning, space-based missile warning, space control again. So I think there's a little something out there for everybody. Thank you. There's several questions uh, concerning intelligence, so I'm going to wrap, uh, wrap them all into one. Um, the Space Mission Force construct is preparing our space operators to be warfighters. But how are we preparing our intelligence analysts within the Air Force to be better utilized to provide our space crews with actionable intel? Rock, why don't you start with that and then over to the rest if you'd like to jump in. Yes, sir. Um, I, think, I think the best way to capture this is uh, within the intel, uh, within the operational crew, um, we have a number of intelligence professionals um, who in my day, there was two of them, and they were exclusively focused on making sure that we understood what those threat indications at INW were for the specific, specific missiles that we were concerned about. As you saw in Desert Storm, we were really focusing on integration and the use of defense support program satellites in order to detect. Um, they did a great job because we did not miss a single that was launched in Desert Storm. Well, now, thanks to uh, my brother, Dennis Bythewood, uh, who's in the audience, I think, today in the Space and Missile Systems Center team, we've advanced the new space-based infrared system and have really taken a quantum leap in capability set. Our adversaries have noticed this, so their change in the writ for the intel analysts that we have on the operations crew is now to uh, reconcile the challenge that we have from the counter space threats. And those will be, as I alluded to earlier, specific indicators and warning of on-orbit threats, terrestrial-based threats, and their cycles that they're on, as well as the cyber threats. Some of this they can accommodate within their nominal crew force allocation. In other words, the number of people that we have some of it, the boss has helped us surge capability, in particular a focus on counter space intelligence. And as we wrap up the SMF over the next year or two to ensure that we have a robust capability set. The last piece is um, in partnership with Air Combat Command. Um, General Raymond has stood up the OPIR Battle Space Awareness Center um, it, at Buckley Air Force Base, in particular in our Mission Control Station. And with the commitment of the A2 team, as well as the commitment of ACC, have allocated over 50 um, intelligence professionals to help us get after exploiting this capability called infrared surveillance for all we can. I can't go into too much about it, but we don't do space for space sake. We're not just gonna fight counter space fights if we have to and are forced to for those sake. The purpose of it is, is to maintain the warfighting commitment that we made to provide infrared surveillance and warning. So I think what you've seen, at least at Buckley, I can say this, is a doubling down from the intelligence professionals on um, both the capability to exploit infrared uh, data as well as the capability to on-ramp uh, counter space indications and warning um, and specific threat TTP uh, modeling for what we would have to contend with if there was a threat on orbit or on, from terrestrial sensors or from cyber. Anybody else? <clears throat> So uh, one of the concepts with SMS, SMF is advanced training or, or AT. Um, in discussions within the 21st Space Wing, AT means slightly something just a little bit different, and it means advanced thinking. Um, we need to think entirely differently about this domain, and it may be that our current intel professionals don't have all the right answers, but it really is incumbent, I would argue, on our CGOs to really begin thinking critically and asking good questions and being curious uh, and getting after it in that regard so that the intelligence community can go back and start picking at those questions. Now, 
the challenge is those questions have to come first, and so it's a little bit of a chicken versus the egg, but it's got to start somewhere. The second aspect also is, is as we grow, as we grow Intel specialists for space and space domain and contested space domain, um, I am hopeful that the NSDC also plays a relatively large role as we try to bring different elements of the space enterprise together uh, so that we can gain access to special data as well that we haven't had access to in the past. Thank you. And just to add a few things from the perspective of the 50th in terms of how we've begun to incorporate our Intel community within our mission sets. And primarily, we've been pretty fortunate to have a cadre of Intel folks at the wing embedded with our different mission space operations squadrons as well who have very creatively crafted a threat book is what it's called and cataloged what we know today about some of the things that we are having to contest and combat in space and some of the systems that are out there and so we found that by embedding our intel personnel asking some of those right questions in that advanced thinking that in terms of what is on the horizon what types of areas should we be concerned about that becomes part of the fabric of how we execute this thing we've called the Space Mission Force and during our advanced training and dwell time. But we're also looking at the cyber threats in addition to that as well. And so it's, it's really at the tip of the spear, I think, and, and the beginning of what we'll soon see as a development for our intelligence personnel and the questions that we're asking and setting some of those requirements so that we're better equipped for what we need to do. All right. Um, there's several questions on innovation. So let me uh, pose this to the panel. How do you encourage innovation and implement ideas from CGOs, NCOs, and airmen uh, that are in your wing? Uh, for us, I, I take the, uh, the lead, my leadership and uh, I've got three basic tenets. Uh, number one is it's, if it's within your authority, go fast. Number two, be bold. Number three, I trust you. Uh, there are no bad ideas. There are just ideas that need a little bit more work, but if we don't allow them to bring those forward and try, uh, they'll never bring them forward. And so go fast, be bold, I trust you, go make a difference. Yeah, sir, I would, I would echo that at our wing as well, and just the emphasis being on, yes, the speed and the deliberation, but definitely in trying to knock down barriers that would hinder any of that type of um, advanced thinking or innovation in terms of the problem solving to make sure that our folks are, are not just able to go fast, but equipped and, and not tripping over anything that serves as a barrier. Also, too, a big thank you to General Raymond. He implemented something within the MAGCOM here along the Shark Tank uh, scenario where if you've got a great idea, um, it, you don't need to bring it up through, through your chain. You don't have to, it, it actually skips, skips me and he, he gets a brief directly. So I know, I think it was just last week and we, we had, I think it was two or three folks from the wing who, who got to brief him directly on just great ideas that they had. So, I mean, certainly we encourage it and, uh, and then, you know, don't snuff it out. There's several uh, questions concerning uh, partnerships with, uh, with commercial space. And so each, each wing uh, has a different flavor of that. Uh, Wayne, maybe, and Mike, you could talk a little bit about partnerships with commercial launch companies like SpaceX, uh, and, then, and then we'll go from there. So, so for us to be successful, it's absolutely critically important that we do partner uh, with our commercial uh, providers. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's hard, uh, particularly in the beginning. Uh, Colonel Grant talked about throwing out the box. That's exactly what we've done with SpaceX. In my mind, they are a disruptive technology. They do things completely different than the way we do it. Uh, and they have forced us, and I do mean forced, they have forced us to get better, infinitely better at what we do. Uh, we are adopting commercial business practices. We are becoming more efficient, more effective, more affordable. Uh, working with them, uh, we have uh, been able to reduce our day of launch footprint by over 60%, reduce the cost of a single launch for them by over 50%, and 
And based on that autonomous flight safety system that they've developed with us, uh, they will help us get to 48 launches a year. SpaceX does not launch on schedule. SpaceX launches on readiness. If they are ready to, to launch tomorrow, they want to launch tomorrow. And as Colonel Huff mentioned, we should not be the barrier between them and a successful launch campaign. They do things differently, and it's good. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, they do force us to, to get better. And what's, what's also encouraging, too, is that they're, they're not the only ones. What, what we see coming down the pike are other companies that, that are looking to do the same thing. So I, I, the 45th has, has been out in front on this, and we're, we're catching up there at the 30th. But, uh, again, we don't want to be the ones to uh, impede that process. And so we have uh, great communication with them. We listen to their needs. And, uh, and, and I wish I controlled everything about launch. Um, but there's some things that we have to work through uh, within the wing, within the other government agencies. We have a pretty strict um, environmental process to, uh, to get things off the ground and to do new things out there. But it's incumbent upon the wing, so not only work with not only work with those industry partners out there like SpaceX, but also to work internally within the government to, to quicken our process. Okay, uh, John, maybe you can take this one. Do you see a portion of it's related? Do you see a portion of space operations such as TTNC? or communications being provided by a service from a commercial company or a commercial provider allowing military to focus their money, time, and energy on defending space? Sir, I think that's a good question. I think right now we're at the inflection point of trying to find ways to be a bit more efficient in some of the more routine operations that we conduct uh, on the ops floor, and really the emphasis with our space mission force, as we've mentioned and alluded to, is the fact that we really want our space operators to be developed in terms of their critical thinking, in terms of thinking innovatively. And so there are a variety of different ways to get at um, taking and, and outsourcing some of those more routine functions. Uh, that might be one of them. Another one is increasing the level of automation that we have. I think both of those are currently on the table in terms of what we're exploring and what we're looking to do. But at the end of the day, we really want to emphasize the skill set in our officers to, to think through what we should be doing in a contested environment in space. There's, a, there's several questions related to crew rest and how do we take care of our folks in a kind of a deployed in place environment. So in regards to the Chief of Staff's recent announcement regarding wing commander's authority to manage crew rest. What is your opinion about the necessity of crew rest to perform space operations? I'm going to turn this to Colonel Miller. Um, Colonel, part of the space mission force is really allowing us to focus more on this, uh, more effectively on this deployed in place mission. And they've just done some really innovative work with a sleep expert uh, to help their crews uh, work this schedule. So, Rock, can you walk through that? Yes, sir. So, um, absolutely, uh, crew rest is important. Um, what we found through the work of our medical group, uh, in particular uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rena Nicholas, um, and the work that she did is not probably dissimilar to findings that we saw in the RPA community, but a little bit different in terms of the demand signal for operations. Um, previously, for example, we would be on 12-hour shift rotations, varied what days on and days off were, but typically a four and four is what you might see, four days on and four days off. So what we did was, after feedback from the commanders, in particular through the crews, um, was look to get to an eight-hour shift rotation and try to compare from an evidence-based standpoint the performance of our operators from a 12-hour shift, sleepiness as an indicator, delayed reaction times, and so on, to what we see in an eight-hour shift. And as you could imagine, um, we have the data that shows that people on an eight-hour shift perform better. Uh, and I don't mean they just perform better in that they feel more awake. Reaction times are better. They're cognitive warriors, so their res response and planning efforts are more crisp. Their ability to collaborate and coordinate is more sustained and timelier. Um, they did a, a just an outstanding job, um, and I think that that information has already been passed to the other wings. Um, as I said before, um, there's, no other, you, there's no other wing that's going to pick up the 50th missions or the 460th missions. There's no other F-16 unit that's going to back us up if we can't do it. So those operators have to be ready. And to transition to an eight-hour crew shift uh, was something that was easy to decide to do, particularly once you saw the evidence. Sustaining it is uh, a challenge. 
I will tell you. Um, but just as you would expect, the captains who were charged with figuring it out came up with an innovative structure for manning their flights. Those flights are actually bigger than some squadrons in some cases. Um, to give the captain or a lieutenant who's in charge of that flight the flexibility to man as he or she sees fit to minimum crew requirements. Um, but we have seen great results in performance and actually have attributed to deficiencies and uh, through the debrief process have dropped precipitously as well. So not only is the evidence there that your, your operators or your warfighters will do a better job with better rest, um, it is contributed directly to operational results. Um, and I think that's good to do the good work of our med group uh, in particular. Thanks. Uh, we just got the hook. But let me uh, wrap it up with one final question. And then I will t I'm here the rest of the week. And so for everybody else that answered a, asked a question, uh, we didn't answer the majority of them. Please feel free to come up and ask me in person if you really want to ask this question. Uh, I'm sorry we ran out of time. Um, the question go is, when do you expect a major conflict in space? Look, what I'll tell you is, who knows? And nobody would know that. It, it's unknowable. But what I want to stress to this audience is that we don't want that conflict. We're all about deterring that conflict and being prepared for that conflict. One of the things that our chief says, and he said it repeatedly, I've heard him, and it's, it's spot on. He said, um, the only thing that I'm 100% sure of is we have between now and then to be ready and to get ready. And that's what we're focused on, getting ready so we can deter this conflict. Uh, we do not want that to happen. In my opinion, nobody wins that fight. And that's why we come to work every day. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate uh, the robust questions. I'm sorry we didn't get the majority of them. Please uh, feel free to hit me at any time throughout the week. And thanks for this opportunity to share uh, what we're doing in Air Force Space Command. Wait. Please welcome to the stage Brigadier General Bernie Scotch. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are honored today to be presenting this space as a warfighting domain. It's my honor to welcome you today, and it's my greater honor to introduce a, a, a panel of clearly the world experts on the topic that we're exploring today, and that's cybersecurity. There's not one of us that's not touched by these important issues that faces both technically and from a human factors perspective. Uh, I'm thrilled, and, and I, I'm not one given to use, uh, to use superlatives to introduce these two world experts uh, with us today. Admiral Mike Rogers, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, the director of the National Security Agency, and the chief of the Central Security Service. Would you join me in welcoming Admiral Rogers, please? And we're equally honored to have with us General Mike Hayden, who's currently the principal at the Chertoff Group and previously served as director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency. Would you join me in welcoming him as well, please? Now, the rules of engagement are very simple, and, and they are whatever Admiral Rogers and General Hayden want to do. Uh, we will first hear from Admiral Rogers, and uh, then we'll hear from General Hayden. And after their prepared remarks, uh, we'll be, we will wel welcome your questions. You should have little cards on your chairs. We have people in the audience who will collect those and deliver them to me, and then we'll uh, moderate the question panel. Admiral Rogers, thank you, sir, and over to you. All right. So first and foremost, thank you all for taking time from busy lives to spend some time for my Air Force teammates. It's an honor to be with you all today. I've been a member of the Joint Force, so to speak. I was literally just thinking to myself, out of 36 years commissioned service, I'm at about 15 years of joint service right now. So I have spent a lot of time in this environment and had the opportunity to work with Air Force teammates as both Commander United States Cyber Command, where we have an Air Force component, as well as the Director of the National Security Agency, where we have 25th Air Force as the Service Cryptologic Element Commander for the Air Force. It's been an honor to work with my Air Force teammates, and I thank you for your willingness to spend some time. It's been great to watch Air Force in its cyber journey. This is a topic that General Goldfein and I spent a lot of time talking to each other about, as well as 25th Air Force about so how as a service is the Air Force going to realize its vision about cyber? 
the cyber fit in the activities that the Air Force is engaged in to help this nation and the department execute its primary missions. I'm going to focus on the cybersecurity piece a little broadly and not be so service specific, although I welcome any questions you have. I will say it is great to see the internal dialogue and the ongoing evolution of cyber within the Air Force. I view that personally as a positive because one of the things I try to tell leaders is we are on a journey and where we are today in cyber is not where we're going to be two years from now, it's not where we're going to be five years from now. And so the idea that we're going to stick to a specific construct, a specific set of operational practices, or a specific set of skill sets over time, I think is very flawed. We have got to get used to the idea of change as a normal component of this mission set and what are the implications of that change from how you build a, a that with your human capital, how you build a mission team, what are the capabilities you need, how do you organize, whether that be formally from a command and control perspective all the way down to at the tactical seam, how do you organize to execute the mission? We've already seen significant changes in the evolution of cyber in the last few years. I've been the, the commander now for um, three and a half years. It's amazing to see the journey. The real focus between General Hayden and I today is focusing on cybersecurity and the, the kind of broad fundamentals I would highlight are, number one, it's about the ability to bring together multiple perspectives and multiple organizations to achieve the desired outcome. The idea that the DOD all by itself is just going to defend its networks, I don't think that's going to get us where we need to go. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the skill sets, what are the technologies, what are the capabilities that reside outside the department that we need to try to access or integrate into our scheme of maneuvers, we're trying to figure out how we defend the department. And I would urge us to think about defense more broadly. One of the things for Cyber Command, one of the goals that I've set for the coming year is, how do we migrate from a focus on the defense of networks, and how do we think more broadly about how we defend networks, combat systems, platforms, and data? To me, those are the four, when I look at, so what should we be focused on defending, those are the four things that I tend to focus on, networks, platforms, weapon systems, data. And so as we're trying to build a, a future for us from a joint perspective within the DOD, we are very focused on those four areas increasingly. We're also asking ourselves, so what, what do we need to evolve to? What does the future look like? Because as I said, it's not necessarily where we are today. Um, and I'm very grateful we got a department leadership that is very much telling us as commanders, as intelligence professionals, you've got to be open to the idea that the future is going to be different than the past. The underlying principles remain fairly consistent over time, but the way we go about achieving them, the way we organize to achieve them, that, that evolves over time. With that, I, I very much look forward to your questions and look forward to what we're going to hear from General Hayden. Thanks. Thanks very much, Admiral Mike. Um, and I'm really happy to be back among, among a bunch of familiar faces. This is really very nice. Um, the Admiral mentioned that, that his risk goes beyond the Department of Defense, uh, specifically said the capacities on which he will have to rely to do his mission, all right, many of them are being created beyond, beyond DOD perimeters. L let me dwell on that as kind of, kind of the private sector guy for the moment uh, on, on today's uh, panel. Look, there are certain things only governments can do. And so let's, let's make sure we fence some things over here that's only government activity. And, and Mike, as if, you, if you look at his testimony, uh, particularly the last year of the Obama administration, it hasn't been so much a focus so far during the Trump administration, but Mike has talked an awful lot about expanding his writ or expanding our understanding of definition of reliance on willingness to use cyber deterrence rather than just defending at the perimeter wire. All right? and, and so I, I totally agree. A, there's some things only governments can do, and I, I agree with the Admiral. We need to explore some of those things further because a lot of his capacities right now are actually limited by policy and sometimes law that we might want to consider. Beyond that, though, let me, do, let, let me also talk about how much in this domain we will be reliant on the private sector. And so I'm happy to talk to the Air Force Association, which is a, a government industry 
partnership, um, an activity that's got things like Cyber Patriot that's trying to raise the national water level of, of cybersecurity, not just narrowly defined military or, or, or Air Force. So let me, let me work a little bit without a net, be, be a little bit provocative, a little forward-leaning. You know, I, when I went down to San Antonio and entered this universe for the first time about 20 years ago, my, my new team down there said, General, take out a clean sheet of paper and a number two pencil and write this down. Land, sea, air, space, cyber. It's a domain, it's an operational environment. We're gonna go fight there. And now that's become accepted U.S. military doctrine, but it had its origins down uh, in San Antonio with what was called then the Air Intelligence Agency. I naturally assumed as a near four decade government guy that defense up here in the cyber domain would look a lot like defense down here in physical space. In other words, it's all about the government providing us security, the way we look for the government to provide security in our airspace or on the ground or in our maritime borders and so on. Over time, I've come to realize that may not be true. In other words, the main effort down here was the government and the private sector should tuck in behind the government in a support role. This audience knows this better than most I talk to. You know, you get that op order out of you know, the Joint Chiefs, and there's a paragraph in there about command and control, and there's very clear guidance. You are the support dead command, you are the supporting command. Or, you know, since we're near Civil War battlefields here, you can pull out an op order from Robert E. Lee and say, sir, sir, your core, sir, your core is the main body. And you gentlemen will conform your, your movements to the movements of the main body. And again, because of my habits down here, I thought in just about every case, the main body for defense up here would be, would be the government and industry private activity needs to tuck in. I'm no longer convinced of that. I actually think in many day-to-day -day circumstances, the, the not first but only line of defense, a practical matter, will be what we can achieve by and through our private sector. And therefore, I call on people uh, broadly in government, not just the commander of cyber command, but, but broadly in government. So if you begin to realize that, accept that, what is it you need to do to empower, or put another way, remove impediments in front of the private sector to be all they can be, to provide the kinds of defense that they may be the only ones who can do it up here. And again, working without a net, I'm gonna use one very specific example. Recall San Bernardino? Recall, recall the cell phone. Recall the steel cage death match between Tim Cook at Apple and Director Comey over, over at the FBI with Director Comey needing, legitimately needing to get into the phone for forensic, evidentiary, perhaps warning of future attacks that may be in that phone. It surprised a lot of people that Bill Lynn, Mike McConnell, Keith Alexander, Mike Chertoff, and Mike Hayden all shaded towards Apple. And we didn't do it out of civil liberties concerns. He was dead. He, didn't, he doesn't have any privacy rights anymore. We, we didn't do it for Apple commercial concerns. We did it on raw security grounds that despite Jim Comey having a legitimate need for that information, one needs to think two, three, or four times before meeting that legitimate need you make it harder for American industry to do what it was I just said to you, I think only American industry can do, which is to raise our overall uh, cybersecurity level. Now, different circumstances, I may have voted a different way. All I wanted to do by introducing San Bernardino was to simply suggest in this domain, that public-private thing may actually be a bit on its head from time to time. And we need to be aware of that. Otherwise, we just won't be all we can be in keeping ourselves safe. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Sir? Since you're up. I'm up. Yes, sir, I'm up. And I am delighted that we are overwhelmed with a stack of questions that won't quit. And I, of course, I've reached the age where I cry at Walmart grand openings, but I'm, I'm getting dewy-eyed here just looking at them. The first question I'll direct to Admiral Rogers. Sir, uh, 
what hasn't been mentioned here today, but is a, a very important topic, and that's infrastructure, the SCADA stuff, supervisory control and data acquisition, pipelines, power grids, water systems, uh, the infrastructural issues that, that are associated with that. Do you think we have sufficient national policy to address that? And how do we bridge between government, between the military and the private sector and the public service sector to make sure that we treat those as urgently as we should? So I think in some ways this goes to a point Mike made. I think one of the challenges of cyber is it is going to force us to get out of many of the traditional definitions that we have used to define responsibility, to define primacy, to define role. So if you look at, if you look at let's take power, if you look at critical infrastructure for us as a nation, from a DOD perspective, challenge number one, you gotta acknowledge it is resident in the private sector. It's not resident in the government. Therefore, you're trying to ask yourself, so how do we apply government expertise in partnership with others to defend something which is not within the government's control or day-to-day -day knowledge in many ways? So as General Hayden said, I think the challenge then becomes what's the construct within that framework, what's the construct that generates the best outcomes? It isn't to me that, hey, I'm the DOD, I'm the 800 pound gorilla, I show up, okay, we understand command and control, we understand how to deploy capability, we understand how to rapidly surge to, to defend or to exercise or deal with problems. We got it now. That is not the way we're gonna need to do this. So I think it's about a true partnership. The second point that I try to make is my military experience has led me to believe you are not, the probability of a successful mission outcome is not particularly high if the first time you're dealing with a problem or a set of partners is in the middle of a crisis. That is not the way to maximize the probability of a successful outcome. So as we're working at Cyber Command, as we're working with DHS, as we're working with the private sector, we've identified actual a, a couple ongoing, we've just started this within the last couple months, where I've argued, let's pick a couple test cases within the 16 currently defined sectors as critical infrastructure for the nation. Between that sector, a particular element within it, DHS and us, as to how are we gonna actually execute this set of defensive responsibilities in the middle of a crisis, attack, or incident. Um, I'm looking forward to see how that plays out because what I hope comes from it is how do we set up an ongoing continual evolution that enables us to position ourselves for success in the day-to-day -day, as opposed to waiting to a crisis to, to respond. And I hope to see some results from that as we head into the next year. Uh, let you, me sir. just add a point to reinforce, kind of back to my earlier theme about we've got to rethink and, and Mike, Mike just mentioned that. So, so that might mean not the DOD or the government is a bit more generous with security clearances or a bit more rapid in sharing classified information, it may actually mean redefining what we mean by security clearances, redefining what we mean by classified information in, in this kind of world. Thank you, sir. General Hayden, uh, reflecting on your time as an Air Force leader, of course, the Air Force operates two legs of the nuclear triad, the, the air threat and the ICBM threat. We had a very energetic panel here yesterday regarding strategic modernization. I'd be interested in your, and then followed by Admiral Rogers, your thoughts on the implications of cyber warfare as, they re, as related to the triad specifically. What are the considerations that we need to take on with respect to fielding modernized uh, nuclear systems? And what are the implications to global threats with respect to cyber in a nuclear world? Wow, there's a lot of unpacking to do on that question. <laughs> so, so first of all, let me, let me just really quickly address kind of a non-cyber answer that was the preface to, to, to the question, which was we've got to get back to our nuclear homework. And I, I, I spent easily a quarter century doing that, whether one warhead, three warheads, or 10 warheads in Wyoming was more or less stabilizing. Remember all that? stuff we went through and, and balance and mutually assured destruction. And you know, 20 years ago I went, oh man, that's gonna be interesting for the historians. And a bit surprisingly and sadly, it is back. Largely because of the rearmament of, of the Russian Federation. And we're gonna go, go, have to go back and, and reinvest, all right, and modernize, and, and, and pull out those, those old dust-covered tomes about nuclear theology, and, and begin to rethink again how we, how we assure stability 
in a multipolar nuclear world. That's a sadness. We're going to have to go do it. But now it's made more complicated because you've got this added dimension of, of, this, of the cyber, uh, cyber aspect. So very quickly, two things come to mind. Um, one of the things we prided ourselves on in the nuclear world, in the nuclear era, was our positive control over our nuclear strike forces, that we knew when to launch, how to launch, and kept them completely under our control. They were totally reliable. They would respond to the order, and they would not respond to anything that was not the order. We, we spent the gross domestic product of a mid-sized country making sure that was always true. And now that's going to be more difficult to make true in, in a cyber world. So that, that would be one additional concern that didn't predate the, the current world. The, the other is what could, and here I, I might actually defer to Mike a little bit because he has talked about deterrence and we need to think our way more through cyber deterrence. I'm really interested in what he has to say. So what aspect of the cyber domain might actually contribute to the broader theory of deterrence, which back in the day we totally relied on our nuclear strike force to perform? I think there's, a, there's an awful lot of thinking to be done about not just protecting our command and control, but how our offensive cyber capacity might actually contribute to what it was we formerly relied only on the physical destruction of our nuclear forces. So as I look at it, it's a little bit like one of my opening comments. So when I look at the nuclear triad, I think to myself, how do we ensure that it has assured command and control? How do we ensure that the platforms and the capabilities are in fact safe and are ready to execute as directed by the National Command Authority? How do we make sure that the data associated with that evolution is non-corrupted, is accurate, and has not been accessed or manipulated in any, any way by anyone other than the intended recipients? Um, so that same challenge where I've said, look, think beyond just the network piece. I look at, at the, the nuclear world and I think, you guys are a microcosm of this. We cannot just fixate on, well, it's just about the network or the C2 link. I think we've got to think much more deeply with, than that. Um, and just as we have seen within the nuclear structure itself, we have come to the, to the conclusion, look, we have got to increase the level of investment and we've got to upgrade the capability to reflect the challenges of today to assure and to con continue to assure that this mission set is ready to deliver to the National Command Authority. There's a cyber component of this as well, and quite frankly, right now, we're working our, our way through that right now, as a matter of fact. It's something that General Hyten and I, the STRATCOM commander, as well as my broader teammates within the DOD, we're spending a fair amount of time right now asking ourselves, so what are the cyber implications of this? Thank you, sirs. This next question I'll first direct to you, Admiral Rogers, and, and there's an abundance of questions here regarding the interface between government, military, and the civilian sector. And I'll synthesize them into this one question. How do we define the boundaries of information sharing with respect to threats, with respect to threat remediation, respect, with respect to actions that we can and can't take as a nation? The financial sector is understandably a little reluctant to share too much because of the effects of, on the financial markets of, of knowing that there are attacks that are happening. But could you share with us your insights, sir, on what's being done to share information on threats and to share information on remediating those threats? So I think General Hayden married a very important point here. I think over time we're going to need to redefine, so what does classified information really mean? What does information sharing really mean? As I'm talking to the private sector about given DOD's mission to defend significant infrastructure, uh, the 16 segments that I've identified as critical against cyber incidents of significant consequence, how is the DOD going to execute that? And clearly the ability to share information in a timely way that's focused on generating mission outcomes is very important to the ability to execute that. One of the things I tell my private sector partners is what I need knowledge of is your network configuration, your network activity, and I need to get a sense for what are your critical paths, where's your most critical information, and if I can get access to that, we, I think we can work together and I can help with your challenge set. The flip side of that is I'm going, look, I don't need to, to watch or necessarily have access continually to your internal business processes. 
and the data often associated with that. that, that that's not what we need to execute our, our ability to defend. The other point I try to remind people is, so what does defend mean? My argument would be what the DOD and as an intelligence professional, what we bring to this defensive mission is expertise and knowledge of the potential actors and opponents, the way they operate, maneuver, and the skills that they bring and the tools they bring, combined with our knowledge of networks and schemes of maneuver within networks. That's what we're gonna bring the table to try to assist. But the flip side is, I don't have detailed knowledge of the particular network configuration. Again, it's one reason why I'm arguing we need to practice, work together on a continual basis. The, the, you know, gaining knowledge of an opponent while you're moving to contact against that opponent is a terrible way to learn. It generally leads to higher casualties, greater cost, greater probabi probability of mission failure, at least longer to do the mission. I'm not interested in doing you know, discovery learning while you're moving to contact against an opponent if I can avoid it. So when it comes to information sharing, I'm always interested in what can we do working together? What insights can we provide each other? Because that's another point I would make. You can't think about information sharing as just, well, it's just the government providing insights. It's got to work both ways. Because quite frankly, the private sector has data and insight that without access to, we're sub-optimized you know, to defend the nation. I want to take advantage of the data analytics. I want to take advantage of the computational capability. I want to take advantage of the kind of capabilities that we can bring that are a real plus to a network we're trying to defend. If I could add just something from the, from the back side of this, because Mike said, we, we need stuff from these guys, all right? What of our current regulatory environment, be it about competition or antitrust, environmental regulations and so on, all put out there for absolute legitimate reasons, have, have the inadvertent effect of slowing down cyber cooperation within a private sector sphere, within the financial services community. And, and so back to my earlier point, you know, one of the things we might want to do is in what ways do our old approaches get in the way of the private sector doing the kinds of things that we really want them to be able to do up here in in, in this domain. Can I do one other point? Sony is very instructive to me as a real world example. So in November 2014, it's hard to believe we're coming up on three years, when Sony is penetrated by the North Koreans, both for the extraction of intellectual property in the form of films, for the extraction of information in the, in the form of company emails and company insights, as well as then the launching of two destructive Viper malwares that end up destroying laptops and portable devices associated with Sony. When Sony reached out to the federal government and said, clearly we've been hacked, we got an offensive act, and we're interested in government insight to help us understand what has happened, how do we make sure it doesn't happen again, and quite frankly, how do we drive them out of the network? You know, the first discussion from my perspective was the only way this is gonna work is if we are open with each other. If we can't do that, this is a waste of capability. We're not gonna be able to, to help you with the insights you need. To their credit, it's one of the best relationships I ever saw. I mean, talking to the general counsel, talking to the CEO, largely, not necessarily me personally, with the immediate feedback, we will give you access to whatever you need. What we ask is, you're very upfront with us about what access do you require, why do you require it, and how, to intend, how do you intend to use the data? After a very quick discussion, it was let's roll up our sleeves and let's go. I just love that. It was one of the best um, real world examples I've seen with the private sector where we were able to very quickly then determine who was the actor, how did they gain access, how did they maneuver within the network, what did they do to the network, how could we make sure that we could help Sony have confidence that they were no longer in the network. And we're able to achieve those outcomes in part because of this, this willingness to flow data back and forth between us. Thanks, sir. General Hayden, uh, I'll direct this first at you. Uh, of course, Title 10 charges the services with organizing, training, and equipping. One of the portions of that equipping cycle is, of course, the acquisition process. Do either of you gentlemen have a perspective on do we need fundamental changes in the way that we organize, train, and equip, and acquire as part of that to reflect the dynamism of, of cyber systems and how quickly they change? Yes. 
<laughs> yes. Now let me ask a follow-on question. What would you recommend as changes, and in, in what specific areas in the acquisition process would you consider those most ripe for improvement? I'll go first, but Mike's, Mike's got the current answer, and he should give the lengthier, more definitive response. Um, we, we may, let me again work without a net here, all right? As, as Cyber Command goes forward, and I, I, you know, now it's a full unified command, I, I think one day, maybe soon, maybe not, it becomes a separate, um, separate from, from NSA. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that would be really interesting to explore would be MFP 12, all right? So that we, 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 we treat Cyber Command because of the, it's the character, the nature of its mission. The, the way we experimented with SOCOM and with, with tremendous effect and success because we gave the, the, the combatant commander some acquisition authorities that combatant commanders have never had before. So I'll, again, Mike's current, uh, he, he knows more realities than, than I do about the current atmosphere, but as a concept, I really would consider a fully mature cyber command having acquisition authorities that, that jump over the train, organize, and equip function of the traditional military departments because of the speed thing. So to go to the acquisition piece, the way we're currently structured, the way I say it is, number one, we've got to fundamentally change this construct. I'm not an acquisition professional. But the way I phrase it to people is, if you look at the criterion for success for most acquisitions, it is, did you deliver on time, at cost, and did you meet the operational parameters as specified in the proposal, so to speak. The criteria that I don't see and that I often say is, so if you want to change culture in my experience and you want to change bureaucracy, you incentivize the behaviors and reward the behaviors that generate the outcomes you want and you de-incentivize and penalize the behaviors that generate outcomes that are not consistent with what you're trying to achieve. So we need to change culture Cybersecurity needs to be a fundamental aspect of how do we define success from an acquisition perspective. It's not necessary now. Um, secondly, I have also tried to argue because of the changing nature of the cyber dynamic, the idea that you are going to deliver a product capability or platform at a particular point in time and then slap your hands and say, cyber-wise, you're good to go. That's not going to work. So one of the things I talk about is do we need to change the life cycle approach to the development and fielding of capability in the department from a cyber perspective, given the rate of change in this environment? And right now, the acquisition world isn't really set up to do that. It's not a complaint. It's an observation. It hasn't had to really work in that world to the same extent. Um, and so to me, we've got to change that. And then the other thing for me as a commander is, and it goes a little bit about what Mike just said, we historically, when I say historically, have structured an acquisition process that was, that was at its heart really designed to generate capital intensive capability that took extended periods of time with great complexity, and therefore you built that into the process. While I acknowledge that some of the cyber capabilities we need have complexity. They are not necessarily capitally intensive in the same way. They don't require the same length of duration to generate. And so another part, and you see this with MF11 and what SOCOM has been able to do in the special forces arena, you know, how do you over time generate that kind of capability for the department? And you've already seen where Congress within the last 18 months on a kind of test basis has granted Cyber Command initial acquisition authority and initial set of funding, as a matter of fact, to kind of flesh and test this concept out. So as a commander, I'm really interested for us as to how we flesh this out over time. We, we had a bit of a kind of a paleo example of this when I was director. And if I read the trade press right, I, I think NSA has just extended uh, the contract for what was known as the groundbreaker program when, when I was director. I mean, in order to focus on mission, we outsourced all of our own IT, okay? All the workstations, all the phones, all the networks connecting them, including the classified networks, we just gave to the private sector because we could not manage their modernization within government procurement cycles, all right? So again, that's kind of a baby step. It's our IT, it's not their IT, 
that we're trying to attack. But, but that has been successful enough that it has been extended. And gentlemen, General Hayden, you mentioned Cybercom's elevation to a full unified command status. Uh, one of our attendees is, would be interested in your perspectives on, uh, both of you gentlemen, on what's good about that and maybe what, what concerns you about that, that change uh, for Cybercom. So General Hayden, if you'd care to lead on this one. Yeah, sure, v very briefly, because this audience knows this, this part of the Bible here, all right? When I got that first briefing in Texas, land, sea, aerospace, cyber, it's a domain, General, welcome aboard, all right? That, that set in motion a train of inescapable logic that we would organize to fight in that domain with a separate command. Once you accept the fact that it is a domain, there, there is no one who's ever been an American GI would doubt sooner or later you're going to end up with Cyber Command. Now, I, I, I got, again, the, the, the first version of it, with the unwieldy name of Joint Functional Component Command Net Warfare. And in late 04, early 05, with Jim Cartwright at Stratcom, I got direct line Title 10 authority to Mike Hayden at Fort Meade, where Mike Hayden could then use the resources that were already there under Title 50 funding to actually do Title 10 break things kind of things rather than just spy on things kind of things. And then that is just a natural evolution. And so to, to answer your question very straightforward, that this is an, an absolute inevitability. It, 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 to me, the, the easy step was the elevation. The, the little more controversial, but I still think necessary step, is the breaking of the, of, of, of the linkage between the person of the commander and the person of the director. Um, the way I would put it is, uh, the current structure is overburdening for one organization and the training wheels are getting in the way of the other organization getting up to actual speed. But here's the guy who's living and I'll let Mike comment. So the current structure today reflects the fact, number one, we acknowledge it was a domain, therefore we felt as a department you need a very traditional war fighting construct for how you're going to execute outcomes in this domain. Thus was born the idea of Cyber Command. At the same time, seven years ago when we stood it up, we also said, let's take advantage of the investments, expertise, and capacity that already are resident within the DOD. And when we asked ourselves, where is that center of DOD gravity in cyber seven years ago, the answer was the National Security Agency out at Fort Meade, which is a combat support agency, although it's an intelligence organization, it is a combat support agency that works for the Secretary of Defense. We spent the last seven years in this construct now of so how do you operationalize cyber outcomes within a very traditional war fighting structure at the same time that takes advantages of expertise, investments, capacity, and capability? And we're now at the stage where we're asking ourselves, does that, are the assumptions and the environment that drove this construct seven years ago, are they still in place today? So I don't want to get ahead of the leadership as this is an ongoing topic. In fact, if you read the president's memorandum on the 15th of August, the White House site, it's online, in which he directed Cyber Command would be elevated to a combatant commander. He also said to the Secretary of Defense, I'm looking for your recommendation as to what the future alignment between these organizations should be. And if you recommend that the current alignment be changed, what would your plan be to do so? And so as a department, we're working our way through that right now. That's an ongoing process. So um, I would just say, let's, let us go through that process, but to me, it also goes to one of my previous comments. We have got to be open to the idea that we are continually evolving in this construct. And look how fast it's gone in just literally just over 10 years. We went from a functional component aligned against a COCOM to alignment with Title 50 authority and capacity to also then saying, well, let's use a very traditional warfighting construct in the form of a sub-unified, to now, let's go to a combatant commander, and I think that the next question in this evolution is, does that alignment still make sense as we've evolved a very traditional operational function? I just think that the rate of change, I tell people, in the life of the DOD, you just take a look at the last 10, 12 years in this mission set, and, you know, like, Mike, I'm at my 36th year of commission service. I am blown away by the 
be a change, particularly against traditional yeah, okay. bureaucratic uh, I'm going to double down on what Mike just said. So I started with JFCCNW, right? Joint Functional Component Command Net Warfare, Title 10, work for STRATCOM, use NSA resources. There's stuff in front of that. There's stuff that predates that. Something Ken Minahan launched called the IOTC, the Information Operations Technology Center, which fundamentally was, a, was an underground secret effort <laughs> to develop cyber weapons under the rubric of an espionage agency out at Fort Meade. I mean, it, it was literally sleight of hand because Ken saw, as Ken Minahan, saw that, to, to get into theology very briefly, if you can exploit another's network, you've already done the operational and technological heavy lifting. All right? The, the actual attack is a subset of the reconnaissance up here in, in the cyber domain. So Ken recognized people are going to be coming to our door about this sooner or later. And he, he, he wanted this small group. There's only about a couple hundred people. I inherited it. And I'm the one who turned the IOTC into a joint functional component command. Uh, net warfare, but there were people, visionaries like Ken Minahan, who saw this coming. Now the punchline is that that is a total of 20 years ago, and in terms of the glacial pace of many things within the Department of Defense, that's amazing. Thank you, sirs. Uh, another one of our attendees, and I'll direct this again first to Admiral Rogers. The theme of this conference is breaking barriers. I'd be interested in both of your brief perspectives on what's Nirvana if there is one, with respect to cybersecurity and a cy national cyber posture, when will we know that we've arrived? And what are the barriers between where we are now and where we want to be? And how should we overcome them? Admiral Rogers. So I always wonder, how do you define arrived? I, I, I just tell our workforce, given the rate of change here, you just got to get used to to the idea that the goal line keeps evolving, keeps changing, and arrival, so to speak, isn't to me, no criticism of anybody, but I try to remind the workforce, I don't think that's the mindset we really wanna have. We gotta acknowledge that that goal line for us keeps evolving, keeps changing. What do we gotta do to keep getting as close to it as we possibly can? Um, I'll let you go, because I want to think of, there was something that flashed in my mind. I, I, just, I, I just said, uh, in this domain, in both the espionage aspect and the warfighting aspect, all advantage is transient. And, and frankly, because it's not capital investment that you described, which is the key to power down here, the advantage is even more transient in, in this domain. So I'll double down on Mike. The goal, the goal lines keep moving. Gentlemen, on behalf of uh, the entire Air Force Association, I can't think of a better group of, of experts to have been brought together than you two. We genuinely appreciate you. You're your setting your standards very low. No, sir, very we low. are not. No, sir, we are not. And as we celebrate the 70th birthday of our United States Air Force, I'm pleased to present you each with a 70th anniversary birthday coin of our Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Admiral Rogers and General Hayden. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the final speaker session of our 2017 Air, Space and Cyber Conference. This conference has been one of our best yet, packed with expert speakers who have delivered relevant and timely information on the current issues, the state of our Air Force and the future of the national security as a whole. Unfortunately, sometimes duty calls and three of our COCOM commanders who were scheduled to speak on this panel are no longer able to attend. However, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to hear from the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, General John Hyten. As many of you know, it is our combatant commands in which the law places the mission of executing operations, protecting our nation's security interests, while our Air Force, is, while our Air Force as a military department is charged with organizing, training, and equipment our forces, it is with our combatant commands that the responsibility for fighting and winning rests. Our speaker this afternoon is responsible for the global command and control of U.S. strategic forces to meet decisive national security objectives. 
He provides a broad range of strategic capabilities and options to the President and the Secretary of Defense. It is a privilege to introduce the Commander of the United States Strategic Command, General John Hyten. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hello, General Everhart. How are you? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I was wondering if anybody's going to show up. Uh, so I see General Cotton. You've got to have uh, General Boussier. That's, that's good. A uh, bunch of missileers and aviators over there. Well done. Uh, you know, I, I used to think the worst slot. God, hello, Dash. How are you? I thought, thought the worst slot in the, in the AFA symposium had to be the slot after the chief of staff. And twice I've been in that slot. But now I get this slot. But the good news was I had my buddies coming with me. So uh, General McDude, General Robinson, General Brown, they're all going to be here. Is it going to be a good time? We'd stand up here. We'd talk about what's going on in the world. Wouldn't have a lot of prep. And then like two days ago, General Robinson, I'm not going to make it. General Brown, I'm not going to make it. General Brown, you're on your own, man. Have a good time. Talk for an hour. Everybody will love it. <laughs> so it is great to be here. I, I tell you one thing. Uh, I never for the life of me thought I would grow up and be the commander of Strategic Command. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. It can't happen. Uh, a blind kid from Alabama that doesn't fly an airplane can't grow up and be the commander of U.S. Strategic Command. It's just not possible. But it did. And so the greatest thing I get to do every day is I get to work. I get to command an organization that has 184,000 of the finest Americans that you can ever come across. Soldiers, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines. And I get to do it. And, and the best days, believe it or not, are not days like today when I get to come and stand up in front of a bunch of people and talk. The best days by far is when I get to go to F.E. Warren and see General Cotton and I get to go out in the missile field. Or I get to go to Barksdale and, and, uh, uh, and see the, the men and women at Barksdale and, and look at 8th and 20th together underneath Global Strike Command and understand what they're doing. That's the best part of the job. The best part of the job is getting underway in the, under the Atlantic in the USS Tennessee, or being in a nuclear submarine in France and England, uh, in the Pacific, doing a change of command on top of the USS Jacksonville. Airmen just don't get to do that, but I've got to. So I feel very lucky to be uh, where I am. But oh my gosh, we live in a crazy world, as General Rand said yesterday. So let me talk a little bit about U.S. Strategic Command from an airman's perspective first, and then we'll walk into the joint world. Because we are among airmen, so it's great to be home. Next chart. So let's talk about U.S. Strategic Command. Let's talk about it from a history perspective. So 1946, not U.S. Strategic Command, but Strategic Air Command. SAC was born in 1946. And who was the first commander of Strategic Air Command? Not that guy. First commander was George Kenney, another hero of World War II, hero of the Pacific. Uh, amazing. But the command was not in Nebraska at that time. It was Curtis LeMay who brought the command to Omaha, Nebraska, 1948. And he was the commander from 1948 to 1957. And that is a, a capture of the painting that's on the wall outside my office. And I want you to look real close at that. And you, you can't see it really, but if you can move around in the back, because I walk by it every day, one of the things that is really interesting about that picture is the artist who painted that picture figured out how to paint it so that his eyes follow you wherever you go. <laughs> and so as I walk in in the morning, he's looking left, looking at me, saying, what the hell are you going to do today? And as I walk across, I look back, and he's looking back. And as I come out in the evening, he looks right, and he says, how'd you do today? That's the legacy of Strategic Command. The legacy of Strategic Command is Strategic Air Command. It is SAC. That is our legacy. But that is not who we are. If you want to find SAC in the United States Air Force, you need to go to Barksdale. That's where SAC is. SAC is Global Strike Command. That is. And, and I sat next to General Rand on the MADSCOM panel at the last uh, phase of the AFA Symposium, I think two years ago now, and he, he was asked what it felt like to come back and be the commander of Global Strike Command. He picked up the microphone and he said three words, SAC is back, and he dropped the mic. 
but it was exactly right. That's what that command is, but it's not our command. But the first change that happened in Strategic Air Command was 1961. 1961 was important because it was Curtis LeMay who looked out across the nuclear force and he realized that we need to be joint when it comes to employing the nuclear capabilities of the United States and we need to be joint and we need to integrate the naval capabilities that you find in our nuclear submarines into that force. And so I went back and read the vision for a lot of, or his, uh, his vision for a lot of reasons. The history uh, was dug out and Curtis LeMay's vision was a unified command for our nuclear capabilities in 1961. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to have a joint command exercising our nuclear capabilities. But the Navy didn't want to go that way. And because of that, we created a, a Band-Aid called the Joint JSTPS, Joint Strategic Target and Planning Staff. A staff to integrate, and that's where the uh, Single Integrated Operational Plan, the PSYOP, came from. That's our history. And that lasted that way for 30 years, and then in 1992, the vision of LeMay was actually achieved with the creation of U.S. Strategic Command where all the joint forces came together to execute the nuclear mission. But then, 10 years later, when U.S. Space Command was stood down, space came into STRATCOM. Then cyber came into STRATCOM, and missile defense, and ISR, electronic warfare, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, all came in to U.S. Strategic Command. And we created a series of subordinate commanders in order to manage those pieces. And so today, you see still a very powerful command. The amazing thing, it is the most powerful command in the world. And a lot of my peers joke when I say that, but there's no other nation on the world that integrates everything in one command like we do. All the strategic nuclear capabilities, the space capabilities, this, this, currently the cyber capabilities, missile defense, all in one command. There's only one command that does that. That's our command. So it's a pretty amazing history. But the one thing I brought back, which is unbelievably important to me, and it should be important to every airman in this audience, is the motto that's at the top. Because the motto at the, that, as the top is the one thing that is consistent since the beginning of Strategic Air Command. Peace is our profession. That defines who we are, and that applies to every mission in U.S. Strategic Command. But if you noticed, there's three dots at the end of pieces of our profession. And the three dots are there for a reason. And it is because legend has it, and I've heard it often enough from enough people that I believe it to be truth, so I'll state it as truth even though I have no proof, is that Curtis LeMay, when the motto was brought to him, said, I really like pieces of our profession, but I want a dot, dot, dot at the end. Because the dot, dot, dot at the end will mean to everybody in the world that if you cross that line, you need to know that the United States is coming and we're coming big. That's what the dot, dot, dot means. So if you look over here and you see the gentleman sitting right here in this room, the commander of 8th Air Force, Tom Boussier, the commander of 20th Air Force, Tony Cotton, they're the dot, dot, dot. They're ready every minute of every day. Next chart. So I'm a big believer in mission type orders. Uh, I don't like commanders who, ex who think they can execute the detailed mission of their component commands. So I publish a commander's intent, and I expect every, hundred, every member of the 184,000 people in our command to have read that commander's intent and understand it. It's unclassified. You can pull it off the web. Anybody can read it. And in that document right up front, you'll find the mission and vision of U.S. Strategic Command. So I ask you to read them right there. And I'll just tell you right up front, I don't like the mission statement. So why in the heck would the commander publish in his commander's intent a mission statement that he doesn't like? And the answer is, that's exactly what we do. That's why it's our mission. So our mission is to provide tailored nuclear, space, cyber, global strike, electronic warfare, missile defense, intelligence capabilities. That's what the UCP tells us to do, and we do that. But today, we do every one of those in its own stovepipe. Even nuclear and global strike in many cases are stovepiped uh, off of each other. The conventional global strike mission is separate from the nuclear. Space is separate from everything. Cyber is separate from everything. Missile defense is separate from everything. And we are U.S. Strategic Command, and we deliver the strategic capabilities of the nation. You heard General Spencer describe my responsibilities, but nonetheless, we do it in seven stovepipes. So the vision, the vision of my command is one team 
one warfighting team, innovative, joint, providing the integrated multi-domain combat capabilities that we need as a nation. And we have all those missions in right now. And cyber's about to leave, but we still have all those strategic missions. And we'll be successful as a command when we can integrate them together. And the effects that we provide will be at the time and place that is right, and we'll be able to seamlessly integrate all those capabilities together. That's what we're moving towards. That's our vision. Next chart. So look at the threats we deal with. So the threats we deal with are on that chart. It's the four plus one that uh, every uniformed person in here is familiar with. So let's think about what our adversaries are doing and how it impacts U.S. Strategic Command. Russia. Last year, Russia, in the fall, did the largest strategic force deployment and exercise that they have done since the Cold War ended. The largest by far. Significant percentages, significant percentage of their long-range aviation, significant percentage of their mobile uh, rocket forces, significant percentage of their uh, submarine launch forces, all integrated together and providing a capability. At the same time, they did a civil defense exercise involving 40 million Russian citizens. 40 million Russian citizens. You can't hide a civil defense exercise of 40 million Russian citizens. So when's the last time in the United States you even remember that, that annoying emergency thing come across your television or the radio anymore? You don't even see that anymore. But the adversary, and they, they, they announced it as a response to a strategic attack from the West, exercised 40 million citizens, which means every Russian citizen basically was involved in that exercise. That's how one of our adversaries is thinking about our business. China. All you have to do is read what China's been writing for 20 years, and you understand what they're doing. China said 20 years ago that uh, we're in order to counter the United States of America, we're going to have to figure out how to integrate our strategic capabilities. So when China does a strategic exercise, they integrate nukes, space, cyber, and conventional to, to achieve an overall strategic effect, both from a deterrent and a response aspect. They look at it all together, and they've written that way for 20 years. They've told us exactly what they're going to do. They're putting all those pieces together. They just stood up a brand new command in the, in the, in the PLA. The command is called the Strategic Support Force. In the Strategic Support Force is space, counter space, electronic warfare, cyberspace, under all one command in order to achieve the strategic effect they need to do to support their strategic deterrent element. Why are Russia and China thinking that way? It's simple, because they've been watching us. They've been watching us since the first Gulf War. They've watched us create the most dominant conventional force in the history of the planet. And they looked at it and said, how did they do that? Can we, can we counter that threat directly? And the answer was, we can't counter it directly, but we can counter it strategically. We can counter it in nukes, space, cyber, electronic warfare. That's where we can counter the, the advantage the United States has built. And so they're going down that path. And they haven't hidden it. They've said it out loud. They've said it in speeches. Vladimir Putin said in 2006, we're going to modernize 70% of our nuclear force by the end of the decade. And they, whether they get there or not, you can ask General Jameson whether they get there or not. But at, at, at the end of the decade, they're going to be a long way there, and we're going to still be sitting at 0% because we won't have started our modernization programs. North Korea, I'm sure everybody on this stage has talked about North Korea this week. But the thing about North Korea is they're moving fast. And two years ago, I kept getting questions about the, the fool in North Korea that was just blowing up missiles. And it scared the heck out of me when I started getting those questions. The reason is, is because when I started in the space program, which was, yes, a very long time ago, we were blowing up missiles too. General Schriever, who we'll talk about at the end of the speech, when he first started down the Corona program, building the first overhead spy satellite, blew up or failed 13 times in a row. 
before he succeeded. Imagine doing that today. But North Korea is going fast. Iran, the Jikpoa is holding right now on the nuclear side, but they're building ballistic missiles uh, all over the place. Short range, medium range, long range, uh, space range, all kinds of things are going that way. And we have this violence extremism threat that, we, that is there, it's going to be there. It's something that we have to be concerned about all the way through. And everything we do in Strategic Command has to be there to support all those threats. That's the environment we deal in. Next. So, November the 3rd, last year, I showed up at Offit. A day that you never think is going to come. A day you become a combatant commander in the United States military. My family's there. Everybody's there. Friends from every assignment I've had. Chairman, Secretary of Defense. 10 o'clock in the morning, the chains happen. 11 o'clock, it's over. Uh, noon, I walk into the Doherty Conference Center at Offutt to meet with all my commanders. And I look around the giant table, and the giant table has every commander that works for me, down to a couple of colonels, Navy captains, that are at the end of the table because they work directly for me. And then I look at the agenda, and every one of those commanders around the table has a speaking role, with the exception of the four-star Navy Admiral Phil Davidson to my left, and the two Air Force four stars, General Robin Rand and General Jay Raymond to my right, who don't have speaking roles because they're not operational components to STRATCOM, all the other commanders around the table are their operational components. And the other thing that struck me was, holy cow, all those components actually work for these four stars. Why can't I just turn to the four star and say, what the heck's going on? How come I don't have a war fighting structure? Because STRATCOM, even though we're listed as a functional combatant command in the Unified Command Plan, STRATCOM is the ultimate warfighting command. It is our nation's ultimate power. And it is a warfighting command from beginning to end. So how come we aren't organized as a warfighting command? How come we have functional components all, all the way through? How come we have standing nuclear task forces uh, across the board that, that work directly for me? Because if you have an organization like this, Guess where the only integration happens in that command? In my office. And I don't know about you, but I'm not smart enough to command an organization like that. I just can't do it. And I want an organization that is organized for war fighting. So on June the 16th, we pull the trigger. And here's the new organization of STRATCOM. And everybody seen an organization like that before? It's really not that difficult. On the 30th of September, we'll achieve IOC of the, of the new air component. The air component is going to be General Robin Rand, the Commander of Global Strike Command. He'll have an AOC that works for him, and he'll have uh, a direct coordinating authority with uh, the tanker and airlift business at the 618th AOC, just like we do in every other warfighting theater. And when I need an air solution or a missile solution to a problem, I will look to one commander to give me that one solution. That means I want an integrated bomber tanker solution. I want an integrated ICBM solution. I want an integrated solution from the air component. That's the way it's going to work. We're going to have a four-star maritime component. Uh, we'll take our time working through that because the task forces we have right now work just fine, but the Navy agrees they would like to have a single maritime component under STRATCOM. We're going to have a space component, because space is big in this, and the space component is not going to be subordinate. It's going to be the four-star space commander, and that is General Jay Raymond, and we'll put the joint forces under him. And then we have missile defense, because one of the interesting things about strategic command, and I use the word interesting because it can be defined any way you want it to be defined, is that I have some very unique responsibilities when it comes to missile defense. I, I the commander STRATCOM, and the coordinating authority from all the combatant commands for missile defense. That's why I have a joint functional component for integrated missile defense. I'm also the approval for operational tests and the certification authority for any missile defense system that is uh, delivered. A combatant command certifies systems before they can deploy. I think that's a service responsibility, but somehow it's assigned to STRATCOM. 
So in the BMDR, we're going to address this issue. But until then, I will have a missile defense component because I have to be able to execute those responsibilities. But basically, look at that. And if you, if you lay the service component on top of that, son of a gun, they're the same people. What do you know? Just like we have almost everywhere that airmen operate. Just like we have almost everywhere that sailors operate. Just like we have everywhere that soldiers operate. That is the way we organize for war fighting. And if you're in a war fighting command, that's how you should be organized, and that's the way we're going to go. Next chart. So I have three priorities in my commander's intent. Those three priorities are quite simple. So I run through them fairly quick. Priority number one, above all else, we will provide strategic deterrence. Next. Priority number two, if deterrence fails, we will deliver a decisive response and we'll do that in a way that means everything that those words say. And priority three is we'll do it with a combat ready force, resilient, equipped, trained and ready, a combat ready force. And the interesting thing about STRATCOM is every time I say that, and everybody in this room, probably 90% of you, as soon as I said strategic deterrence, decisive response, combat ready force, you went to the nuclear mission in your mind. And that's where you should start. But that's not where you finish. Because those three priorities apply to every mission in U.S. Strategic Command. So if war extends into space, no, by the way, there is no such thing as war in space. There's just war. But if it extends into space, then we need to be able to ideally deter that from happening. If that doesn't work, we'll provide a decisive response. And that decisive response may or may not be in space, but it will be decisive. And we'll do it with a combat-ready force of combat-ready airmen that are trained to operate in the denied environment that space has become. It applies to cyber. It applies to missile defense. It applies to electronic warfare. It applies to every mission in U.S. Strategic Command. But somehow, we only think about strategic deterrence from a nuclear perspective. So we have a problem there. And the airmen in this room need to start thinking about that problem. And the problem is that strategic deterrence in the 21st century does not equate to 20th century deterrence. The fact that we have 1,550 deployed strategic nuclear weapons under the New START Treaty and the fact that the Russians have 1,550 weapons under the New START Treaty does not provide the total strategic deterrence of our nation. Strategic deterrence in the 21st century involves any strategic attack on the United States, and that strategic attack can now come through space, come through cyberspace. And if you think that's not true, imagine a world where, through cyberspace, we lose our entire electrical grid. Through space, we lose all of GPS that is for the world. If we lose GPS, we lose the ability to get gas out of gas stations. We lose the ability to get money out of the ATM. We lose the ability to go to the bank. We lose the ability for stoplights to work. You have pure chaos in the world. We have to defend against those attacks. That is a strategic attack with a strategic effect. We have to figure out how to do that. But if war extends into space, the response may not be space. But it needs to be strategic, and we have to figure out what that really means. Uh, this is a multipolar world we live in, not a bipolar world like it was in the, in the Cold War. When it's a bipolar world, all you have to worry about is your actions, what do, the, what do the Soviets think about your action? When you're in a multipolar world, everybody watches you everywhere. Any action we take in the uh, Northwest Pacific today impacts multiple nations. Anything we do in Europe impacts multiple nations. Everything we do in CENTCOM is watched by the entire world. It is a multipolar, multi-domain problem, and strategic deterrence is fundamentally different than it was last century. And we have to figure out how to talk about that. We have to figure out what that means. Because our job is to be able to provide the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States strategic options to deal with in our most difficult times. And those strategic options uh, need to cross the spectrum of what we can do as a nation. Next. So a lot of people ask me, what worries you the most? What keeps you up at night? It seems to be a fav favorite question for the Commander Strategic Command. Because I think everybody expects me to go right to talk about Kim Jong-un and North Korea. 
or maybe I go and talk about Russia. What I talk about is that I'm very concerned that our nation has lost the ability to go fast and that we have adversaries now and we see proof in those adversaries that they're going faster than we are, faster than we are on nuclear modernization, faster than we are on building hypersonic uh, uh, glide vehicles and hypersonic deployed weapons that are very difficult to counter, faster than us in space, faster than us in building counter space capabilities to deny space, faster than us in cyber. So I ask myself, how is that possible? Because one of the greatest strengths of our country, one of the greatest strengths of our Air Force, one of the greatest strengths about the entire joint force we operate in is we've always been able to leverage the industrial base and go faster than anybody else in the world. And now we're not. We are not. Other people are going faster than us. So I went back and I, I looked at the beginning of the Navy nuclear program and I looked at Rickover and then I went back and I looked at Schriever, who's one of my heroes. And the interesting thing about Schriever is that, you know, I think everybody in here knows General Schriever, but my guess is very few people in this audience know General Phillips. And if you want to know who was the key to Minuteman One, all you need to do is ask General Schriever, and he'd tell you it was Sam Phillips. Because the Minuteman One program was structured by a small number of airmen in a little red schoolhouse in Los Angeles in 1957 initiated by Congress in 1958 with $214 million of appropriation, and then $2 billion of appropriations for the next five years. And when we got to 1964, we had invented a three-stage solid rocket ICBM with a very similar capability that we have today in the Miniman 3. We deployed it at five Air Force bases across the country in 800 brand new missile holes with brand new infrastructure, with brand new nuclear command and control across the board, brand new copper cables that went all the way across the Midwest in order to hook everything together, nuclear hardened, EMP certified, all those capabilities, five years, total cost in today's dollars, $17 billion. And today, our program, the GBSD program, IOC 2029, FOC 2035, 400 three-stage solid rocket ICBMs, refurbishment of missile holes, the nuclear command and control is a separate budget. Total cost estimate right now, $84 billion. Slow, expensive, that's the way it is. So when I've said that, I've said that now for a few times this summer, trying to get people's attention, and it has been reported in the newspaper that I have trashed the acquisition community, or I have criticized the test community, or I'm criticizing Congress and the budget process. Only one is ever reported. What I'm actually doing is I'm criticizing the entire process. And it starts with the budget. If you don't have a budget, if you want to know why General Schriever was successful, General Schriever was successful because, number one, he had simple requirements. Everybody understood what they were. On the first of the year, every year, he got his full budget. If he needed more money, he went back and he got more money. He was able to structure the program accordingly. He also had Sam Phillips, who was the program manager in Minuteman One. Sam Phillips understood what it took to go fast. He understood what it took to go to take a risk. He understood how to take smart risk. He understood that failure was part of the process and we needed to fail every once in a while in order to move forward. He understood that integrating three stages together and, and firing it off for the first time is actually not any riskier than doing it one at a time as long as you understand how each one of those things work. Why is that important in our nation's history? If somebody knows Sam Phillips in this audience, you don't know him for the Minuteman One. Why is Sam Phillips most famous, in my opinion? Sam Phillips, in 1964, was pulled, kicking and screaming from General Schriever to go manage the Apollo program for NASA. He's the one that convinced Werner Braun Braun that it was okay to stack three stages together 
and launch it because you've seen it in the Minuteman One. And yes, it's risky, but it's no more risky than than taking them one at a time and then putting them together and finding there. And he said, no, by the way, that's the only way we'll get to the moon by the end of the decade. And he was given the authority and responsibility to execute that program as a one-star Air Force general assigned to NASA. He was given that as a colonel and a one-star for General Schriever to execute the Minuteman One program. We gave authority and responsibility, we put it in the right place, and we said go, and go fast. Uh, the test program was structured so that we would understand the test, but we understood what development test was and operation test was, and we didn't just duplicate it because we could duplicate it. We did it one time, and then we deployed a capability. I look at our industry today. People think I am insulting industry when I talk about that. I work with industry. Industry has the ability to go as fast as we want them to go, as fast as we tell them to go. If we give them good contracts, good incentives, they will go fast. If we don't, they won't. It's really that simple. You go back to our history, the history of airmen in the United States Air Force. You go back to Major General Schriever on the cover of Time magazine in 1957. You go back to May, uh, Brigadier General Sam Phillips, who became, both of them became four-star generals before they retired. Both of them in the same job, interestingly enough. The commander of Systems Command, Material Command now, is where they both finished their career. That's our legacy as airmen. This is our legacy as the Joint Force. This is our legacy as a nation. We have the ability, if we want to, to go fast. All we have to do is put the right people in the right place, put them in charge, give them the authority responsibility, have a budget for gosh sakes on the first of the year, and then figure out how to execute and go fast. And I tell you, when you have threats, like I talked about earlier, that are going faster than you are, it's not just because it's the right thing to do, it's because it's for the security of this nation. We have to go faster, and we're not. And it is frustrating the heck out of me. And I ask everybody in this room, to make sure that as you go forward, wherever you work, in industry, in the Air Force, in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, wherever you happen to work, one of our things that we all have to do is talk about going faster than our adversaries and look at the threat. And if we're not going faster than the threat, then it's wrong. I don't care what it is, it's wrong if it's not faster than the threat. So I've said enough there. Next chart. Holy cow, U.S. Strategic Command, a global warfighting command, the most powerful command in our nation. We do amazing things every day, and we focus so that we are ready to respond to any threat that requires our capabilities. That's who we are. I'll be looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, General Hyten. That was great. I, I certainly learned a lot. Um, well, there were several questions, as you can imagine, uh, many of them uh, thematic. Um, and so let me take off uh, with one of the charts you just briefed. Um, and there were several questions about, and I, let me summarize it this way. <clears throat> uh, we've been told all week that the Air Force is uh, too small for its mission. We've talked a lot about the lack of resources, the uh, age of our aircraft, the uh, lack of pilots, the lack of uh, maintenance folks. Um, we don't have a budget. We're looking at another CR. Uh, and the, the basic question is, given all those things that the Air Force is wrestling with, how can we go fast? So the, uh, uh, I, I don't want to answer a question of the question, but I'll start that way. And so the corollary is, how can we not go fast? Uh, you know, it, if, when we were, and we are still the most dominant military on the planet, we are. And I think we've become spoiled by that. And we've become spoiled about space operating in a benign environment. We've been spoiled about not really counting an air threat for really a long, long time. We have airmen that have really never experienced an air threat in combat. Uh, we have all those capabilities, but we have adversaries that are looking at it different. So we went through a period uh, where we went through what was called capability-based development. 
And capability-based development says kind of define what you want that can deal with any threat that's out there, and we'll just kind of build that capability. We'll take our time, and we'll get to that capability. People forget what came before capability-based development. It was threat-based development. Everything was about the threat. Everything was about responding to the threat. So I'll tell you, General Spencer, if we don't change our attitude and we just talk about capabilities and we don't talk about what we need to respond to the threat, nothing will change. Nothing will change. But if people take the threat seriously, and oh, by the way, why is China building weapons in space? Because they think it's a cool thing to do or they, they love to expend their gross national product on those kind of weapons? No, they're doing it to challenge the United States. That means we have to respond. Why are they building hypersonic glide vehicles? Why are they testing it ahead of where we are? Because they think it's just a cool thing to do and it's fun? No, they're doing it to challenge the United States, to challenge our strategic deterrent. That's why they're doing those things. We have to get back to everything based on the threat. And if we don't start talking about the threat in public, in open, and what it really means, nothing will change. Thank you. A lot of questions, as you can imagine, on the strategic triad, uh, ranging from uh, do you still believe in a strategic triad? I already know the answer to that is yes. So let me shift the, the other, some of the other questions along those lines, really dealing with recapitalization. Uh, and the, the basic thrust of the questions are, you know, all three legs of the triad need to be recapped. Can we afford it? And, and if so, or if not, uh, can we afford not to? That's right. And, that, and you said it, you can't afford not to. Because, again, if you go back to the question about do we need to modernize, do we need a triad, it has to start from the threat. And the threat starts with Russia. And you need to be able to make sure you can deter Russia in any strategic environment. And the strategic cables that Russia has right now, with long-range long aviation, mobile ICBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, uh, fixed-base capabilities, and missile defenses, when you put all those capabilities together, the triad that we have is essential to being able to deter Russia. And you heard the Secretary of Defense this morning talking about why that's the most important mission. So I won't repeat what he said. But if we're going to do that, it's about countering the threat. So if you want to say, I don't have to build and I don't have to modernize everything, the only way to do that is to change the threat, which means that's the job of the State Department and others to figure out how to get to a different world where the threat is not the same. But as long as the threat is out there, our job as a military is to deter that threat, which means if you look at a threat-based perspective, we have to have a ground-based strategic deterrent. We have to have a bomber. Oh, by the way, we have to have cruise missiles along with that bomber. Uh, anybody that's uh, an aviator in this room, if you, if you only have a bomber that can attack one target at a time with a gravity bomb, that is not the most effective deterrent for an adversary. You have to have that. You have to have a submarine, and you have to have a submarine with modernized capabilities, and you have to have modernized nuclear command and control, and you have to have modernized weapons. You have to have those capabilities unless the threat changes. So if the threat cha doesn't change and this, and this country doesn't do anything about the threat, then that is what is absolutely essential, and you have to have it, and there's, there's really no way to argue around it. Thank you. Uh, as a COCOM commander, you've had the opportunity to step away from the Air Force. Uh, and sort of look at it from the outside looking in. Uh, having done that, uh, is it your opinion that the Air Force is doing a good job to prepare its officers and NCOs for joint duty? So, no. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're doing a good job. And you've got to understand, I love the Air Force. I really do. I, I'm, an, I'm an airman at my core. That's, when I look at myself as a professional, that's, that's who I see. I see an airman. And I, I love the Air Force desperately, but we don't build people, we don't prepare people for joint duty until really the uh, general officer levels. The general officers that the Air Force nominates to come to STRATCOM are spectacular. They're really at the top of the litter. And all the other services is the same way. Uh, but the lower you go in rank, we don't prepare people well uh, to go into the joint community. People don't understand the joint community. They don't understand joint operations. We have to teach them that when they come to our command. And we are, but when, when you don't do that, that puts us at a disadvantage, us as airmen in this case, as a disadvantage with other services.
because other services are focusing on doing that from the major perspective forward. They really strategically think about that. And I think as an Air Force, it's our responsibility to make sure we provide the joint force, not just with the quality people, because the quality is not the issue. It's the training. We don't really train people effectively for those joint duty assignments. And so when they come to STRATCOM in particular, and I've talked to other combatant commanders, we have to build that up. And it shouldn't be that way. Okay. Uh, can you discuss the threat of EMP attacks on the U.S., and uh, what, what are we doing to counter that threat? So the reason I'm laughing is that uh, during my confirmation hearing uh, last, uh, whenever it was, October, I guess, a year ago now, I, uh, I got the, that question from Senator Wicker from Mississippi. And uh, he said, uh, so General, have you read the book one second after? And I said, no, Senator, I haven't. He said, well, uh, let me tell you about the book. So he gave me a 30-second description of the book, which is about EMP pulse going off, and it's a novel written. So he gave me the 30-second description. He said, so now give me an assessment of the book. <laughs> and uh, so guess what? I went and read the book. My crack staff, when I got home, had to pay. You ought to read this book. And it's a book about EMP. But I, I've looked at EMP since I was a, a young officer, young engineer, because I was building systems to respond to EMP. An EMP pulse is a very dangerous threat, uh, and it's a realistic threat. It's something that would basically, if you're not nuclear hardened, it will basically shut down any digital computer uh, that is operating in the, in the range of the EMP. So if you set off an EMP, a high altitude burst EMP, basically every light in this hotel is going to go off, every computer is going to go off, every cell phone is going to go off, and every automobile in the parking lot will no longer work. That's what an EMP does. Uh, therefore, we have to be able to respond to that AMP. And so uh, I was asked, is STRATCOM ready to respond uh, to an EMP attack? And the answer is yes, because we have nuclear-hardened satellites, nuclear-hardened command and control shelters. We can be able to respond to that, et cetera. But our nation as a whole has not really looked at EMP. We've not looked at the critical infrastructure that could be damaged by EMP. And we need to kind of take a step back and look at that entire threat, because it is a realistic threat. You can use a nuclear weapon. The most likely way to create EMP is with a nuclear weapon. And you don't have to actually kill anybody directly with a nuclear weapon to create that horrible EMP pulse. So we have to think about what that means and how we would respond to it. And we haven't really stepped up. But if there's any good news in that story, it is STRATCOM will be able to respond to that kind of attack because our capability survived through that kind of attack. Sure. Uh, you mentioned your, one of your first, prior, or your first priority was deterrence. And uh, one of the questions was, can you, can you discuss or describe what deterrence looks like in space and cyber? So there is no such thing. Uh, you know, I, I actually, for whatever reason, it took me a long time to come to that uh, realization. Deterrence is about an adversary. It's not about a place. You don't deter space. You don't deter cyberspace. It's about an adversary. So, so to take space, if something happens bad happens in space, there is something really bad going on on this planet somewhere, somewhere with an adversary. There is some significant conflict going on in this. And so the first thing I'll do, say the conflict's in the Pacific, and we suffer something going on in space and cyber. The first thing I'm going to do is I want to talk to Admiral Harris, who's in the Pacific, and find out what the heck is going on there. So what we want to deter is our adversaries. And we want to deter our adversaries from carrying a war into space, which we, means we need to use all the, terms, uh, all the tools of deterrence to influence the adversary not to take the war into space. Now, the other thing to think about is deterrence is about Deterring strategic attack against our country and our allies. That's what deterrence is. People think deterrence is about eliminating weapons. No, deterrence is about making sure weapons aren't used against our country because we'll either impose such a cost on the adversary that they can't stand it or we'll deny the benefit they want to do because we de can defend ourselves so well and we communicate that credible capability so that everybody understands what that is. And we're going to have to do that with our space capabilities, our cyber capabilities, our conventional capabilities, our nuclear capabilities. That's what 21st century deterrence really is. It's all of those pieces together to deter our adversaries. Because if you just think about space, 
and you just think about cyber, you're not thinking about what is motivating our adversaries to go that way. So deterrence is about an adversary, not a place. Okay. Uh, in the spirit of total force, do you, ever, do you ever see a reservist or guardsman taking on senior positions in a combatant command? Well, uh, I personally have no trouble with that. The, the smartest uh, person on nuclear execution in my command is Major General Rick Evans, who's a guardsman from Lincoln. Uh, who I, I asked him the other day, how many nuclear exercises have you done? And he doesn't know, but it's either in the hundreds or thousands. Uh, he can do it. He understands the, the nuclear capabilities of this country backwards and forwards. He's the most significant advisor trainer that we have in the command. He happens to be a guardsman. I don't know about you guys, but when I've deployed, I honestly don't know who a guardsman or reservist is when I deploy. I really don't. Uh, I've been shocked multiple times at uh, one, two, and three stars that I've worked with forever when all of a sudden they tell me, you know, I'm, I'm an Alabama guardsman. What? How long have you been a guardsman? Well, pretty much my whole career. Really? I didn't know that. One of the strengths of our service is that it is a total force. And so my belief is you should pick the best person for the job, and I don't care what uniform they wear, what component they come from, where they are, it's the best person for the job. If it's Navy, it's Navy. If it's Guard, it's Guard. If it's Reserve, it's Reserve. I don't care. I just want the best person for the job. And nobody I know cares what component you come from. They just care that you are competent and you can lead. That's all they're worried about. So I don't have a problem with that at all. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question. How do we balance national missile defense, in parentheses, ballistic missile, cruise missile, against emerging threats, against the cost and the destabilization, destabilizing impact on our deterrence relationship with Russia and China? So, uh, so there's, a, there's two or three uh, books uh, written uh, on that subject that I would uh, recommend to you as you walk through. So the the concept of missile defense is an unbelievably complicated concept. And, and cost is a critical piece of, of the piece as you come into it. But let me just talk about missile defense and the overall strategic turn, and then I'll walk into it. I won't, I won't actually give you a dissertation or, or recite a book. I'll just give you the big pieces. So the, probably the biggest piece is uh, three elements of deterrence. I went through them a while ago. Impose cost, which is our nuclear capability. That's the ultimate imposition of cost on an adversary to prevent them from acting. Number two, deny benefit. Guess what our missile defenses do? They decide, they deny the adversary the benefit from an attack because if, uh, if North Korea launches a ballistic missile at the United States, we will shoot it down. We will. So the, whatever benefit they have in their calculation that think they're going to achieve because of that, they will not achieve it because the missile defenses will shoot it down. So what is the value proposition of that capability to, to deny the benefit to North Korea? To me, it's almost infinite. Whatever you have to pay to do that, you have to pay. But in the overall construct of, of missile defense, one of the things that we have to do in the old overall deterrent construct is we need to figure out, so how much and what kind of missile defenses do we need? As long as we're on the interceptor train, we need the most effective interceptors we can, and we need to be looking at new technologies like directed energy in particular to figure out how to change the cost equation to put more of the advantage on the defense rather than the offense. Uh, we always need to be looking at that. We need to figure out how to integrate the other domains into that equation so we understand what is the best sensor suite. And right now it's a ground-based focused sensor suite and I believe that it should be a, a space-based sensor suite that enables the missile defense because in the long run it's actually cheaper. Because I don't know how many islands in the Pacific and islands in the Aleutian in the middle of Alaska, we're going to build giant billion-dollar radars that only protect one thing. When you can put capabilities in space, yes, that cost an equivalent billion of dollars, but cover the entire planet that then enables that. So you've got to change the cost equation as we go through that by looking at the entire enterprise. So it's about the fundamentals of deterrence. And denying benefit is extremely important, and that's what missile defenses do, so that has to be part of the architecture. But well, when is the last time you see somebody in academia, in a think tank, write an integrated deterrent story that talks about the integration of offense, defense, space, cyber, to create the effect? I don't know of any in the United States that integrate those together, but I can point you to some very good Chinese articles. So we need to think about it differently.
Okay, uh, General Hyden, one final question. Uh, and one of the great things about this week is, as you can see, we've got a, a sea of, of blue uniforms. And one of the things we're really happy about this year is a lot of those uniforms were young folks, young lieutenants and captains, uh, young airmen and young NCOs. And almost every form we've had, there's been questions about work-life balance. And you have a very busy job, a uh, very responsible job, uh, some would say stressful job. How are you able to balance that with, you, with your responsibilities to the nation, with your responsibilities to your family? So the smartest thing I ever did was marry Laura. Uh, because, yeah, those of you who know her, I just heard some applause. That's the smartest thing I ever did. Because guess what? Uh, if, it was, if I was left to my own devices, and I can tell you that's, that's the way I was as a young officer, and, and actually my first 10 months in squadron command, I was that way. I was in the office when I was a first-year squadron commander, uh, probably 16 hours a day, at least six days a week, sometimes seven. I was in, uh, in the ops center on mids. I was in the dorms in the mornings. I was... I was everywhere because I thought that's what I had to do. And I was like, so excited to be a squadron commander. That's what I wanted to do. And, and Laura was just beating on me and beating on me. And then there was three master sergeants that worked in my squadron. And the three master sergeants uh, saw me frustrated one day. And they, they were the three senior NCOs in the organization. 250-person squadron, 101st-term airmen. The commanders in here can understand the challenges that come with that kind of organization. And so they came into my office and said, sir, uh, we can understand your frustration. We can see it. Why are you frustrated? And I said, man, I feel like we're doing good as a squadron, but I can't get through to the airmen. I'm trying everything I can do, and we have, keep having these discipline problems. I can't get through to them. I know every one of them by name on the dorms. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And they looked at me, and they said, sir, why didn't you just ask us to take care of the airmen? That's our job. Why don't you just be our commander? If you would just be our commander, I think we'd all be a little bit happier. <laughs> you know, those three master sergeants, Jim Patton, Robbie Robinson, God, just amazing, amazing folks. They looked out for me, and then my wife watched me to make sure I wasn't there. So I made a commitment that day that I was only going to be a commander if I was a commander. I wasn't going to do the NCO's job. I wasn't going to do the DO's job. I was just going to do my job. And then Laura said, uh, why don't you come home for dinner every night? And so every night for dinner, I came home. I would leave the office at 5.30. Uh, now, every day at STRATCOM that I'm back at home, I actually go home roughly 6 o'clock at night, 1800. I go home, and I have dinner with Laura. Now I have a skiff in my basement, and, and I have. <laughs> All right, so I, I'm cheating a little bit there. But I do go home, and I have dinner with my family every night, and I have dinner with my wife. And you know the amazing thing about that story? Jim Patton, Robert Robinson, Bill Brokell, those three NCOs, the last year I was in command, I was getting home for dinner, I was seeing all my kids' soccer games. I was, unless something was, you know, happened to spin up. Uh, I was going to school plays and all those things. Uh, yeah, I still got called in the middle of the night and all those things that happened, all th those things happened. But the second year I was in command, my squadron set every operational record Air Force Base Command had ever seen. We won the Guardian Challenge competition as the best. We're, we won the Henry Award as the best squadron in the Air Force. And I was getting home every night at a reasonable time. And my family life was a lot better. And Laura was a lot happier, which meant I was a lot happier. And I remember that to this day. And to this day, I fight to get out of that office. Because the other thing that happens, if you don't leave the office, all your folks don't leave the office either. And they don't have balance in their lives. And you know what? As busy as my job is and as crazy as this world is, if something really bad happens, guess what? I'm fully connected. They're going to call me. And guess what? That stack of stuff on my desk, I'll be able to get to it tomorrow. And if it's really important, somebody in the staff is going to come to me and say, sir, we need to do this right now. And I'm going to do it right now. 
So you can maintain balance in the most difficult jobs. And, and if you had talked to Laurel, she will tell you that the job I'm in right now is the most stressful job I've ever had. Every time there's a launch out of North Korea, it's, I don't know where it's going to go. And every time we're on it, and whether it's the middle of the night or wherever, we're all over it and we understand what it is. And we're working with all the other combatant commanders. Uh, it is a difficult challenge to have the responsibility for all the strategic nuclear weapons of the nation. It's a significant challenge to understand that if the day, nation has its worst history, it's going to come down to me to explain that to the President of the United States so we can figure out what to do through one military aid that will translate what I'm saying to him. It's a challenge to have all those things, but you know the best thing that keeps everything together is I come home and Laura's there. And I know not everybody is married and not everybody gets to know somebody like Laura, but I'll, I'll tell you one last story to tell you the power of a spouse, and then we'll finish. Because I think it's a, a good story to end the formal conference on. So I was working for the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a one-star, and it was General uh, Jim Cartwright, former STRATCOM commander, United States Marine. And I'll just let you know, I swear to God, he never slept. He never slept. And my standing meeting with him was 0545 on Monday morning, and I wasn't the first on the calendar. And I was going like crazy all the time, and I was TDY away from my wife. And then I got PCS order, so I actually kind of PCSed in place. But I started out as TDY, and then Laura had to do the move all by herself. And I went to General Cartwright and said, can I go back and help with the move? And he said, okay, you get a day and a half. So I went back for a day and a half. The mover was delayed. I actually left Laura as the moving truck pulled up. Bad moment. All those things are happening. Everything's going wrong. I come back. I'm working for John Carr. Laura does the move all by herself. She does everything all by herself. Everything is all set up. She does that all by herself. And then about a week later, all is done. And she picks up the phone. She calls me and she said, so John, I understand you got a tough boss and you got a tough job and you're doing important stuff. But here's the deal. Uh, I'm tired. I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to Cancun. I'm taking a date. I'd like it to be you. <laughs> so I don't care how scary your boss is, because the next moment I had a chance, I went in and told General Cartwright, I'm taking leave, and here's why. And he looked at me and said, that's a good reason. <laughs> Have a good week in Cancun. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. John, we want to thank you for showing up. I, I got to tell you, um, it's, it's unfortunate that your colleagues couldn't join you, but I guarantee you, for me and for the audience here, we're certainly glad you, you came. And you alluded when you started out uh, by being surprised or it, you said it was impossible for you to end up in this job. I got to tell you two things about that. One, those of us that know you and have worked with you are not surprised at all. Uh, and two, those of you that have known and worked with you are glad you're in that job. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Great thank job. You thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I know it's the first session after lunch, and everyone just had a nice meal, so let's get everybody invigorated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great. On behalf of the Air Force Association, welcome back to our Airspace and Cyber Conference, and we have a, have a really exciting panel for you today. Strengthening and sustaining force readiness is one of the top priorities of Air Force leadership, and is, it is imperative for the United States to maintain its air power dominance. This afternoon's panel, Air Force Rapid Capability Development, is one of the many professional development forums where we will speak about pressing matters prevalent to our Air Force. The rules of engagement for the session are as follows. Our speakers will make a short presentation, then take questions from the audience.
Please write your questions on the cards that will be passed out by our volunteers. Moderate, moderating the question and answer portion of this session is Jack Blackhurst, Director of the Plans and Programs Directorate and Director of the Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Directorate, Air Force Research Lab. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our speakers. General Stephen Wilson, Air Force Vice Chief of Staff. General Ellen Polakowski, Commander, Air Force Materiel Command. <laughs> Lieutenant General Arnie Bunch, Military Deputy, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition. <laughs> Lieutenant General J.D. Harris, Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Requirements. And finally, James Gertz, the Acquisition Executive at the U.S. Special Operations Command. Our speakers will now give their opening remarks. Let me start off with, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, people got to see uh, the Chief of Staff's discussion earlier today. And, and I can just tell you what an amazing chief we have. And to be able to work with the chief and secretary as we Take our Air Force here in the 21st century is uh, really cool. Um, can you imagine, though, General Goldfein, when he wakes up at night, what he thinks about? Let's see if I can get a slide to come up here. Here's what I think he's going to think about. Oh, no, that's not my slide. Go, go more, one more, please. Wilson! <laughs> one more, there you go. <laughs> he's surrounded by both sides. Right? Well, he's, uh, what a, again, what a, blessing that we have is uh, to have as chief of right now in this really uh, chaotic world that we live in. One of the biggest challenges you heard the chief talk about is what does the 21st century Air Force look like and what does it look like in 2030 and what's in our way? And what's in our way is, this, is that the world is changing in unprecedented ways in a time and scale that, that uh, is really dramatic. And I talk about the Massive disruption going on politically, economically, socially, and technology-wise. And when you combine all four of those, it makes for exponential disruptive change. And with that, we've got to change how we acquire products. And our product development cycle, I think, is too long. Can I get the next slide, please? I went to a small state agricultural college, but this is my formula. All right, we have a two problem. In many cases, we're too slow, we're too expensive, we're too hard. We have too many stakeholders. You heard the secretary talk. We have way too much guidance, and we're too risk adverse. In the meantime, we also have uh, competitors around the globe that are changing and putting focus in areas like hypersonics, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, robotics. And the gap that we once had, which was large, is now shrinking. In some areas, I'd even say we could be behind. So being too hard, too complex, and, and number two does not make a number one Air Force. So that's some of the things I think this panel's up here to talk about in areas that we can change. Can I get the next slide, please? But we have a way forward. I, I don't know if anybody knows the picture on the guy on the left, a very famous airman from our past. Maybe one of the most famous last names that, uh, in our American history that we don't think about. His name is Warren Avis. Right, he was an airman. He got out of the Air Force in 1946. He had this idea that I'm going to go sell cars at airports after flying for the United States Air Force. The big dog at the time was Hertz. And if you remember his motto, it was Avis. We're number two. We try harder. Right? And he did. He changed the face of how they sold, uh, how they rented cars. And he really put a lot of pressure on Hertz and caused Hertz to change because of that. So I think it's sometimes important to realize when you're number two and how you have to try harder. And when you're number one, what do you have to do to adjust to the changing world dynamics? The other picture I'll show you on the right side of that slide, if I were to ask for a raise of hands of who knows what that is, and I've asked thousands of people, I, I, very few people know what that is. It's a Chinese app and it's called WeChat. And so you heard the chief talk about 
do you share data? Good. Uh, and or data today in the 21st century is what oil was in the 19th century. But here's what China did. I think they, in many cases, out-innovated us in this app. Because that app made by Tencent is a, a, what I call a super app. So all the things that we do inside of our applications is done in one app. Uh, so f inside that app is the equivalent of Facebook and YouTube and Skype and Uber and Yelp and ways, and on that I can chat with people, I can uh, do my online banking, I can uh, order rides. Uh, it, it's uh, an all-in-one app that encompasses uh, many different things. I'll tell you to check it out. 1.2 billion users use that app today. 900 million in China, and yet most of America hasn't heard about it. And so if I said uh, YouTube and Facebook and, and Yelp and all that data. What if I said air, land, sea, cyberspace? And all that data was shared inside one app. It'd be pretty remarkable. That's the way I think we have to think differently. In this case, somebody took what we were doing, changed it, and put together a pretty powerful capability that's taking all the data and sharing it across one platform. So I, I'm going to stop talking here, but I think there's a lot of room for how we can change the way we do business across, across this capability development. Because it's not just acquisition, it's requirements, it's acquisition, it's contracting, it's testing. But we've got to be able to take the, our current capability development process and take it from what I call 10 Moore's Law cycles and do it much, much faster. The good news is we've got some fantastic people here that know how to do just that. I'm looking here at uh, four captains that are sitting a few rows back. Chris Pence, Steve Lawyer, uh, Austin uh, DeLorraine, and Joey Atora are part of this tech accelerator group. Uh, go check out with them afterwards. They're working down in their, our AFWorks booth downstairs. They came and briefed me on an idea on a tech accelerator and what, they, what they're doing with a venture capital company uh, to be able to explore how we do counter UAS, uh, counter unmanned aerial system, how do we defeat that and how do we leverage that? And they've got an exciting opportunity. And so I look around this room and say, the way we're going to fix it is the people sitting around the room. And I'm, I'm excited to be part of the team that's looking at that. And I know the rest of those folks here are going to talk through how we're going to get after this problem of capability development and do it faster. Next chart. Our next slide, I guess I should say. They told me to hold it up close. Okay, JD, over to you. All right, got it. Um, thanks everybody for having us here. You've heard a lot about some of the, uh, well, at least one school up on the stage. So t at this time, I'd like to make a quick shout out to all the ROTC teammates in the room. There is room. <laughs> okay, um, as you'll find out later, it's all an acquisition process that, that we struggle through at this point, and, and you know where the fault for that lies. But it, it is a process, and, and as we're going through uh, what we're trying to do on the requirements side of the house, we're trying to reduce the requirements, and, and it'll take multiple hacks, but our first attempt is try and cut that, that timeline in half, uh, and then we'll probably swing it again and try and do that again uh, in another half. But the Capability Development Council is our lead for that. And that's where we come together as often as we can or as often as we need to to make sure that when we meet, we are looking at where we are appointed the Air Force, uh, and then we'll come back to it later and determine what can we actually afford to get to. And that's part of what the Vice Chief was talking about. If we've got a lot of requirements that are out there. We don't have enough budget to fund all of those. So we're trying to make the best in the, uh, the priority of choices to get there. Sometimes at CDC, uh, to get after some either small things or quick hitting items, we'll meet virtually, uh, and then we will continue to, uh, to make progress on the ECCTs that we have done in the past. But part of that, we just completed the Air Superiority 2030 ECCT. Uh, we had one person in charge. That person did an extremely great job coming out and produced, here's the plan, this is what we need to do. Uh, and then we've had a tough time to actually getting the resources to go out and make that happen. So I would expect you'll see some organizational changes coming up here in the near future in the 5-8 to make sure that we are getting after the design process to, to make sure that rather than doing all the hard work 
and then trying to integrate what we do. We'll get the integration up front and then push it back for the hard work after that, that'll, that will surely follow from the MAGCOM. So you'll see some changes coming uh, real quick uh, in where we're headed for the Air Force. And then AFWorks, you've heard a little bit about that. That is our innovation storefront. And the first one will open up in Las Vegas, and that is not Nellis. It is actually downtown Las Vegas. That's important. That is where we go out and say, rather than try and close on a gap that we recognize is out there, what other things should we be aware of? We weren't thinking as a military about stealth. We were allowing others to come in and provide that to us. Uh, we'll probably have that same thing from a lot of our garage mechanics, our, our, our darkroom hackers, those types of things. So AFWorks will be our open door for that. Thank you. Next slide. Let's see if I can do this right this time. May not be voice activated by me. Okay, so General Wilson, thank, and for everybody out there, thanks for being here, and we look forward to your questions. The comments are going to be pretty short. We really want you to get some questions in so that we can try to answer them and we can address with what you want to hear about as we go forward. So uh, please take care of that. General Wilson, thanks for the lead-in and saying that it's not all acquisition. I appreciate your recognition of its requirements, its all parts. It's also the financial piece. For General Harris, for your comment that it's all acquisition, as we say down south, God bless your little heart. Uh, if anybody's from the south, you know what that means. If you don't, you can talk to me later and I can give you a real definition of what it means. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of the efforts that we have ongoing in acquisition, and these are just a few, we really got a lot of initiatives going forward to try to speed the process up. Some of those to speed smaller acquisitions are delegating down and pushing down authorities. You heard the Secretary in Chief talk about that relative to squadrons. We're doing that in the acquisition community of pushing decision-making authority down below the program executive officers. That's really been embraced. Today, 68% of the programs that we can delegate below the PEOs have uh, been delegated to include all of those that are ACAT-3 programs over in the space portfolio. So we're really trying to do that. We're looking at where we can uh, raise limits so that we can move money or make decisions in a manner without having to go say, mother, may I, in a lot of different ways. We're addressing that with OSD and with everybody else. Uh, we are pushing modular open and uh, trying to make that reality. We've taken that now down into subcomponents. So right now, one of the ones that is uh, on everybody, alternative PNT, position navigation and timing is a big issue. Uh, one of the things we're actually doing is establishing an open standard that's going to go in a uh, resilient enhanced GPS INS so that we can insert software later to address problems that may come up to have assured position, navigation, and timing, which is critical to what we do to put weapons on target, run all of our systems, and make sure our communications work properly and get everything synced up. So we have a lot of efforts going into the modular and open. We're putting it in our big acquisition programs, which many of you have heard about, but we're also putting it in a lot of other areas that we are uh, trying to do across the enterprise. Uh, we, one of the things that we continue to talk about, and General Wilson talked about, you gotta, get, uh, you gotta be willing to take more risk. One of the things we're pushing is we need to get agreement on how much risk you're willing to take. You know, if you want something that's a 99.9% .9 probability of working, that's a different uh, solution set than if you're willing to take a 90%. And we just need to be informed and have the dialogue with all parties so that we understand what we're doing so that we can go faster where we really need to and maybe build off that in an incremental approach where we do the requirements in increments as well. Uh, the other one we have to do, we need to all, use all of our authorities that we have available, and we need to be able to use all of those new ones that Congress has pushed us to streamline our acquisition efforts. Congress has been really supportive. They've given us a lot of legislation to get us uh, some rapid prototyping, rapid fielding, experimentation. They've given us a lot of different ways and trials we can do. They've been very supportive and we're working with them to communicate what we need to be able to do, uh, what other impediments we run into so that we can try to move even faster. And we also have to look at agile business practices. Uh, what, what I mean by that is, if you've managed one program, you've managed one program. Every program that we do is different. And what works on uh, ground-based strategic deterrent may not be what works on a new radar for a platform or it may not be what works for a business system or an agile software development. And what we have to do is utilize all the contracting authorities and the business practices we have and, and to make that work. And then the last one, which is really, really important. This is a team sport. If we're gonna do this right, we gotta have a great dialogue with uh, the requirements folks so that we understand what they really need 
and they understand the ramifications of what they're telling me they need. And then the other one we have to do is we really have to have a transparent dialogue with industry because industry in a lot of ways is on the uh, nose much more about where technology is and what's not made out of unobtainium uh, so that we can make sure that we're developing programs that are executable and we need to work together to make sure we do that in an expeditious manner to get at what we need to do for the warfighter. And with that, I'll pass it over to General Paul Kaskin. Okay, let's see if we can get the next one. Oh, look at that. See, look at that. It was instantaneous. How do you like that? Okay, so uh, unlike um, my, my, my fellow airmen up here from the Pentagon who can point at each other and try to blame who is it is that's slowing down or not making capability development happen, in Air Force Materiel Command, the buck stops here. Capability development has been a core mission of AFMC from its beginnings, even before AFMC was AFMC. So. When we talk about developing capabilities for the Air Force that the Air Force has today and will have in the future, there isn't anywhere else in the Air Force that it happens besides AFMC. The technologies that are explored that are going to lead to the next capability come from the Air Force Research Lab. The Life Cycle Management Center and the Nuke Weapon Center are the nexus of how we actually work with you in the industry to deliver those capabilities. The sustainment center, part of the de capability development is ensuring that we can actually keep these airplanes, these systems flying and working and, and work every time an airman is counting on it being there. And the test center is our conscience that those dreams we had for capability aren't reality unless they actually work the way we thought that we designed them, and that's what the test center does for us. And then the Installation and Mission Support Center ensures that we have what we need on the installations, and we have the support contracts, and we have everything else we need to do it. So it's a package deal for AFMC. All, all six of our centers have to be part of this team. And, but what is different today than back in uh, 30 years ago when AFMC was first stood up? And I think you heard snippets of it first from General Wilson and then General Harris and then General, General Bunch. There's been a number of significant things that have changed and I think for the better when it comes to enabling AFMC to be more effective as long as we are able to leverage these tools. General Harris talked about the Capability Development Council and the Enterprise Capability Collaborations teams. Those were, when we stood those up, I think arguably for the first time maybe ever in the Air Force, we started to look at capabilities from a full enterprise perspective. We looked at it not as something in space, so we, you know, a group over there worries about that piece or something on the ground, something in mobility or something in uh, air combat. When we stood up the the Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Office and the Capability Development Council, we embraced capability as an enterprise capability, not as platforms that were kind of kludged together. And that was significant in enabling Air Force Materiel Command to be able to tackle things from an enterprise perspective because we had that function in there. The second thing that happened was what General Bunch talked about with respect to opportunities for new ways of doing business. And that includes some of the additional uh, authorities that were given to General Goldfein and the other chiefs that have enabled us to do the things like the experimentation we had. We have uh, new contracting authorities or uh, revisions and rejuvenation of contracting authorities that we've tried to, that we have leveraged. And also the introduction, introduction of technologies that have allowed us to do things more rapidly. Um, we are, the ability of embracing those vendors, shall we say, that are not normally the ones that we deal with, which is what the, the great team of our tech accelerators has been able to do. To, last year, I think it was, somebody asked me why there weren't any entrepreneurs on the floor. And I said, well, you wouldn't find an entrepreneur at the op or a millennial at the opera, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you got four entrepreneurs sitting right there, and they're working with an entrepreneurial firm 
uh, that is helping them to, a, 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 an entrepreneurial broker, I call it, I know they don't like it when I say that, that's reaching out to other entrepreneurs. So that's where you're going to find the entrepreneurs, is by what they're doing. And so what AF, Air Force Materiel is doing right now is we're providing the people, the energy, the nexus to make those things happen so that we can leverage all of those things, the things you see on there that enable us to get things to the field faster. Example recently was the light attack experiment that you heard the chief talk about. We conducted that from the beginning to the end, getting the, getting the, the airplanes there in less than six months. That would have taken us two and a half, three years to do uh, using, with, if we hadn't leveraged uh, the things that we talked about here, to include the Capability Development Council, to include these, to include the encouragement from our chief and the vision that he has. So for me, the whole transition we have done in the last two years um, is encouraging to see that we do have the tools in place as long as we empower our airmen to be able to use them. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, those who don't know me, Hanno Gertz, I'm the Acquisition Executive down at U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you guys. And again, perhaps uh, use SOCOM as uh, one of the many places to pilot new things, uh, see uh, what we've been working on and what uh, can be scaled up to work at the Air Force level and then uh, what uh, doesn't scale up so well. And so the, the first thing I would say is um, don't rely on the people on this stage to give you permission to go make changes, take initiative, be persistent, go get it done. If you're waiting for us, we are going to fail. Okay? There's things we can do for you. We can help remove barriers. Uh, but it's really on you to take the initiative. And, and the biggest thing down at Special Operations Command, where, again, I see where the Air Force is also moving, it's a culture, it's a mindset, and it's really leveraging uh, our great people. Uh, and so there's an incredible amount of talent sitting out here. Uh, I've seen more chiefs here than I think I've seen uh, in forever, and I've seen more CGOs than I've seen in forever. And, and so the ability for you guys to leverage both that experience, the no kidding one has to happen uh, on the flight line or back in the shop, as well as new ideas is really where, uh, where you guys are going to be able to take this to the next level. That's uh, kind of by the nature of our culture inside at SOCOM where, where we get some advantage. Uh, because for us, velocity is our competitive advantage. Uh, and so everything we're doing looks at velocity, right? Velocity is speed in the right direction. If you can go fast over the cliff, that doesn't do you much good either, right? So you got to know where you're going and then uh, get out and go after it. Uh, and then have a mindset uh, that you're going to be pioneers. You're breaking barriers. You're, you're doing the things the Air Force is known for. Uh, if you can leverage that mindset, you can make uh, great strides. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, things, you know, a thing that keeps me up at night is a great idea sitting out in the audience that could help me get a mission done, help me get something to the operators uh, that doesn't get to somebody who can act on it. Okay, so there's kind of two parts of the equation. One part of the equation is get the ideas, uh, and so SoftWorks and a lot of things we're doing to reduce barriers to get ideas to us uh, is really important. But the harder half of that problem is then actually get it in the field. And so don't just think about it as a buying problem, right? Because a capability is equipment, it's tactics, and it's training. And you can have all the best equipment in the world, but if you don't have folks trained and if you don't have the right tactics, you can't really exploit it. And so the, you know, the key for us is closing that distance between operator, uh, technical people, and acquisition folks. And the uh, more we scrunch that down, acting in an operationally oriented culture is really where you can get some great acceleration. Uh, I love to see the things going on with decentralizing and pushing decision levels down and all that. That's great. Uh, but you guys got to be willing to step up, all right, uh, and be accountable and take risks. Uh, and, and again, I think you're hearing the leadership in the Air Force uh, signaling that's the intent. Um, and again, hopefully. Uh, everybody will step up to that. And then the, the last piece I would just say is, um, yeah, we've got a lot of great single instrument players out there uh, and, and talking in acquisition terms or even as industry. We know how to do a FAR Part 15 contract really well. And if you go to SOCOM, we can do that really well. But there's a lot of new instruments out there. 
And so what I look for in our best leaders, uh, especially for you uh, young folks out there, I look for three things. I look for curiosity. Are you looking at all the different tools? Are you asking questions? Are you coming to SOCOM and seeing what we're doing? Are you seeing what your buddy's doing somewhere on a different program? Are you taking initiative? Are you willing to go try? And that might mean failing, and that might mean you don't get the best performance report what you tried. And then are you persistent? Are you going to work through the first contact with the bureaucracy that tries to hold you down? Uh, again, we need to do it on the government side. Industry and the audience, I would say the same thing. You become a mirror of us, uh, and so if you aren't willing to change in the same way, we're going to get stuck kind of with the same results. So I think there's great opportunity. It's absolutely imperative we go after it. Uh, business as usual is not going to get us here. A lot of great tools out there. Um, we've got to figure out, one, as leadership, how to enable you, and then two, as a folks in the field, whether you're in industry, on the flight line, uh, or in, uh, in a program office, step up and uh, seize those opportunities. Thanks for the opportunity to comment and join the crowd here. Okay, very good. Uh, now it's an opportunity. Uh, while they've been speaking, you've been writing me questions, and so I will get it. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, and so I will try and get through as many of the questions uh, that you have. So uh, for the vice, uh, the first question is, earlier this week, the secretary announced a new S&T study, study. How is this fitting into capability development? Yeah, so the Secretary has asked us to look across all of S&T to prioritize what's important, to be able to look at both basic and applied research so that we can prioritize those areas that we need to focus on. Where do we have a competitive advantage? Where are we at a disadvantage? Where would, we, where would we spend our next dollar? And then how do we partner again with all the different universities and, and uh, uh, centers across the country where this expertise is? So uh, I, th I think our S&T community is, is, hey, they're working really hard. They're really fantastic. If you go talk to General Cooley and his AFRL team, they are unbelievably talented. Now we're going to just need to be able to focus that research and prioritize that research. And again, as, as, as Mr. Gertz talked about the, at the end, this velocity becomes a competitive advantage. We have to be able to, to, be able to move, move fast, focused in the right areas, and keep our competitive advantage. So I, I think... Uh, we're, we're really looking forward to this study coming up. I know there's a lot of people that will help in it, uh, but I think it will help shape the direction we head uh, through our 2030 uh, development time frame. Okay, for General Harris, what is the Air Force doing to expand this capability development model to include sister services, coalition partners, or other government agencies? Well, that's a great question. The, uh, the Capability Development Council already includes our joint partners, so you see that participation already from, from our Navy and our, our Army land teammates. But we are recently now expanding it also to Five Eyes, so trying to take it out of the secret no foreign environment, bring it out to where it's much more releasable, uh, and we'll see some of the original partners, uh, Canada, Australia, UK, uh, moving right into the effort and, and already volunteered participating and providing information on what it is they're doing at their country. So we'll see that collaboration pick up even more here in the near future. Thank you. Uh, General Palakowski. How do you convince the military-industrial complex to buy into the vision of interconnected systems when protection of proprietary data and architecture feeds their profit profitability and survival? Well, I, I know a number of ways to convince the industrial base of anything, but one way I do it is when I put out a, re, a request for, him for a proposal, and we essentially re, it articulate that we value what the chief talked about, right? I mean, he said there's the first question. Can it connect? Good. Can it communicate? Even better. And I think the bottom line for us, as you heard it from the top just earlier today, that our, uh, we, when we see the future of warfare in 2030 and beyond, that chief 24, that we are, our focus is going to shift from not looking at individual platforms, but the network, and as the chief says, the apps and the apertures. And the way you're going to be able to be competitive and be able to be part of that network of apps and apertures is to be able to answer those two questions. And the way to answer those two questions is to not to give me something that doesn't connect because it's a proprietary solution. And, and I, by the way, um, We've done some things that I think that have, that have 
worked collaboratively with the industry to make this happen. The open mission systems, for example, which was led by the RCO and now has transitioned to the Lifecycle Management Center, was not done by the government developing the standards and then putting it into a spec. That was done with a collaboration of the industry to develop that, and we're continuing that model, and in fact, we're expanding that model into other, other areas. So I think the first thing we do is we make sure you, everyone understands that it's gonna be all about the network, because as General Wilson said, it's all about the data and the speed at which we can get that information in an actual form. The second thing is we're not going to go at this kind of like we did in the past where we did things like, anybody remember ADA? That was a real success, wasn't it? Um, we're going to do this collaboratively with you, with the uh, industry, uh, industry community to find something that is an optimum for all of us. But in Alan Polakowski's opinion, the day of proprietary stovepipe architectures is over for the Air Force because they don't connect and they don't communicate. Thank you. Mr. Gertz, how does USO, uh, USS uh, SOCOM define success with their model? And is there an example you could provide? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, success is uh, proven on the battlefield. Uh, and so, you know, everything we do has that bent to it. Um, but you've got to be very careful that you don't measure everything you do by does it affect the battlefield tonight or you can have a, you know, six-day problem for the next 20 years. So our, our, our approach is really to think about uh, innovation and new methods in, in a couple of probably three different dimensions. One is can it help me tonight? Can I do what I have to do every day better and better and better? Uh, second dimension is what I would call discovery. Is somebody doing something? Is there a product out there? Is there a tool out there I can immediately adapt uh, and either create a new effect or uh, be able to execute a mission better uh, with that? And then the third is what's kind of new to the world? Uh, and where are you going to create capability which does not exist? Uh, and so the way you attack each of those is a little bit different. Um, a lot of what we're doing with SoftWorks, partnering with the Air Force on Air Force Works is, is really working on all three of those dimensions. Are there tools out there today that can help what we're doing today better and better? If so, buy them, right? Are there things that we can put together in new and different ways uh, to create a new capability or take care of an, an existing gap in, in a new and interesting way? Uh, so it's more discovery. And then what's kind of the pure invention piece of it? Um, because if we don't start um, challenging our basic assumptions, we're always going to be reacting. And so capability gaps tend to be a reaction. So you're trying to close a gap. I want to create gaps against my competitors. I want to open up gaps and get them to chase me. And so you've got to be able to also not just think about current problems, but creating opportunities as you go forward. And so we again, use a, a multitude of uh, really interesting tools to get at that. And that third dimension of kind of new to the world tends not to be as expensive uh, in dollars, it tends to be intellectually expensive. And so that means you've got to really uh, exploit diversity. You know, if there's a problem we have in the Air Force, I bet if we got everybody in this room engaged, we could come up with a better way to solve it. Uh, but right now, you get stuck in whatever squadron silo you're in or whatever program office silo you're in, and if, heaven forbid you have an idea to help the fighter mafia if you're in the bomber mafia, right? And so part of what we're really trying to do in SOCOM is how do we break that kind of uh, cycle so that, you know, what we find is our most creative ideas are almost directly proportional to the, the amount of diversity of backgrounds and opinions and experiences uh, looking at problems. If you just get the same people looking at it, you tend to get the same answers. So, I, you know, again, how I measure innovation in each three of those dimensions uh, is fundamentally different, uh, but all important. Thank you. General Bunch, one of the biggest challenges to going fast seems to be the need to align acquisition, finance, contracting, and requirements. What are we doing to align all of these stakeholders to go fast? So uh, I think I gave a speech the other day, I said I think the first step is to admit that you've got a problem. So uh, we have admitted that we have a problem. Uh, 
we are talking about one of the examples I will use right now, we're trying a Pathfinder program, and I think uh, I'll use that as an example of where I think we will have to eventually go. It's uh, Air Operations Center. We're doing a Pathfinder to do agile developmental ops of the software, and we're taking a small uh, bite at the overall apple of what requirements we need, and we're trying to align the contracting strategy, the way we do the testing, the way we do the development, how we work with a warfighter, and we're trying to synchronize all those together to go a different way. And in this one, there, I will say now there is 0% chance we'll get it 100% right. Um, but what we hope to uncover as we do this and discover as we do this is where are the roadblocks? Where are the impediments? Where do we need to get more help? How do, it, for example, if I want to do a test and I want to put it out and I need to do it all automated, I have to design all that testing in up front and create the right infrastructure so that I can do it and I get all the community to buy in before I can go down that path. That's not historically how we have done our acquisition programs. We've done development and then we've tested and then we've put out in the field. We've done it in serial. This is an attempt to see how we can merge those together and uh, try to make that work. I believe we're going to need more flexibility with how we use dollars and more flexibility to move dollars around with where the requirements are. I think we're going to need uh, help with the requirements, and J.D. and I have talked about this. How do we make the requirements a, a container that we operate within so that we can do incremental and push things out to get more capability to the field quicker? We're going to have to look at our contracting methodologies and how we do it. Uh, and we're looking at some of those. We may need to do time and materials for some development activity, which we've not historically done. Or we may need to, do, we need to use all kinds of different methodologies, and we've got to think through all these because each situation is going to be different. But we are trying to attack those. And the fact that we're talking about it's the whole spectrum of things is a big step instead of just pointing at one part of the community because we've all got to work together. We really want to solve this. And much of it is beyond the Air Force and the Department of Defense. If I could, I just want to add a little bit on to this because um, General Bunch has hit on some really key things, but there's more to this. There's some cultural change we have to do. Um, I, when I look at, when we talk about agile software development, and you talked about the AOC 10.2 and what we were doing there, you know, we, we have become very structured in, in our processes across the board that are focused on what's good for hardware. And so we have, as I, as I like to say, we're very enamored with our systems engineering V. And by golly, we are going to be disciplined and go through that systems engineering process and devolve requirements down and then do design little pieces and test it. I put it to you, we have to start thinking about this a little differently. If you look at the requirements, instead of taking them at the top and involving them down to little details, and then working our way back up to the, to the big requirements, which is what our traditional hardware process does, we have to look at it slicing it the other way so that we can get something delivered quickly. It may not do everything that we do, but then we put it in the hands of the warfighter. That's like Mr. Gertz said. And we may find that 40% of what we were going to do actually isn't what we really we need or want anymore because we got something into the hands of the operator quickly. So we have to, we have to change the way we think in every single discipline in our business, whether it's engineering, contracting, financial management, and then we can start to tackle what are some of the challenges with respect to laws and regulations, but I'm convinced that a lot of what we, that a majority of what we can do, we can do without changes to the law if we just rethink and, and get ourselves out of that structure that has become, that is so focused on hardware and think about this in a different way. Can I, uh, I'm going to pile on to that great comment by uh, General Pajkowski about uh, culture. One of the things that we're also going to start doing is making sure we drive outcomes. So let's take a look. A couple weeks ago, uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon put out an uh, outcome to Amazon that said, we're going to do same-day delivery. Okay. 
Here's what I think happened inside Amazon. I bet 2,000 people coughed up a hairball. <laughs> what? Sa same day delivery? That's, we can't do that. And yet, they will now find a way to remove the processes that stifle that from happening. They'll learn to take risk in the following areas to drive that outcome. We're going to do that same thing. We're going to start driving outcomes across the capabilities that we need. Right? And, and to do that, we haven't talked much today, but there's a whole piece to this about the human capital piece, the development of our people that understand, as General Bunch talked about, where we can take the risk, as General Pikowski talked about, developing this empowered culture of people that can drive outcomes. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so, uh, uh, the Vice. Uh, many of these initiatives like ActWorks, ECCTs, and experiments will require long-term funding to make a difference. In the current fiscal environment, how are we making sure there will be money left behind for these initiatives? Jack, if I heard the questions, all, all those do take money, but we're going to, again, as we drive outcomes, as we look at uh, uh, another model that says we're going to plant a bunch of seedlings, we're going to experiment broadly, prototype, double down where it makes sense, and then be able to drive success on those areas that are, that are flourishing. Uh, we, we know that some of them aren't going to be successful, right? but we, what we can't do is we cannot continue the current path the way we do business. The world is changing too fast. This, uh, as Mr. Gertz will tell in uh, different forms, we've got this globally accessible technology, the results and capabilities that, that uh, often has malicious intent and our adversaries are, are maneuvering faster. We have got to become faster. We've got to become more agile. And so we're going to experiment broadly. And so with, whether it be DIUX or with AFWorks, uh, with, with a bunch of different prototyping experimentation, to see what works, and then be able to double down in those areas and see if we can uh, jump ahead. Thank you very much. Bill Spencer, want to close this out? Hey, hey Vice, if I can just pile on, it, kind of the SOCOM approach to that, um, where I think you guys are heading, and we're in similar directions, right? One's kind of vision of future, so back to prioritizing what's important, where do we need to create either capability, uh, overmatch, or deal with it. Right? You got to create modular and scalable platforms, as Jerome Palakowski said, so that if you don't have it perfectly right, your opportunity risk to change it to get it right is not start over and spend a couple of years. And then you've got to relentlessly and boldly experiment. And again, for everybody in the room, especially those non acquisition folks, that doesn't mean lab guys only. That means experiment on the flight line, it means experiment in tactics, it means experimenting you know, back uh, across the whole Air Force. And then finally, you've got to create an acquisition system, combination requirements, funding, contracting, that can capture those opportunities. I, I think, uh, you know, you do those four things, you get back up on step, and, and, uh, and that's at least the way we're approaching it, and it sounds like we're, we're well aligned. Okay, thank you all very much for our speakers for a very uh, timely and informative discussion. Also want to thank you all for being here and participating. I think this was, uh, I got a lot out of, out of this discussion. I hope you did as well. Um, for full coverage of this year's conference uh, can be found at AFA's Daily Report. Please go to airforcemag.com to catch up on all the latest Air Force news. We will now take a short break. Please return to your seats by 2.05 p.m. and refer to your programs for the next speaker session. Thank you very much. I know it's the first session after lunch, and everyone just had a nice meal, so let's get everybody invigorated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great. On behalf of the Air Force Association, welcome back to our Airspace and Cyber Conference, and we have a, have a really exciting panel for you today. Strengthening and sustaining force readiness is one of the top priorities of Air Force leadership, and is, it is imperative for the United States to maintain its air power dominance. This afternoon's panel, Air Force Rapid Capability Development, is one of the many professional development forums where we will speak about pressing matters prevalent to our Air Force. The rules of engagement for the session are as follows. Our speakers will make a short presentation, then take questions from the audience. Please write your questions on the cards that will be passed out by our volunteers. 
Moderate, moderating the question and answer portion of this session is Jack Blackhurst, Director of the Plans and Programs Directorate and Director of the Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Directorate, Air Force Research Lab. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our speakers. General Stephen Wilson, Air Force Vice Chief of Staff. General Ellen Polkowski, Commander, Air Force Materiel Command. <laughs> Lieutenant General Arnie Bunch, Military Deputy, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition. <laughs> Lieutenant General J.D. Harris, Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Requirements. And finally, James Gertz, the Acquisition Executive at the U.S. Special Operations Command. Our speakers will now give their opening remarks. Well, let me start off with, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, people got to see uh, the Chief of Staff's discussion earlier today. And, and I can just tell you what an amazing chief we have. And to be able to work with the chief and secretary as we Take our Air Force here in the 21st century is uh, really cool. Um, can you imagine, though, General Goldfield when he wakes up?